Commission for uh, Wednesday, February 10th. Uh, I think we will attempt to take roll here. If I see Jackie, greetings, Jackie. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Michael Baker. Here. Thank you. Todd Byrother. Here. Greg Francis. Here. Sylvia St. Clair. Here. Thomas Anderson. Here. Thank you. Carol Shook. Okay, I don't see Commissioner Shook yet. Uh, Clifford Winger. Here. Thank you. Joanne Wright. Here. Mary Winkus. Here. Councilmember Kinnear. Here. And I just want to say it's so nice to be back. Great to have you. All right. And we have a quorum. All right. Thank you all. Uh, we'll start as always with a public comment period. If anyone from the public would like to address the commission on a topic not on today's agenda, now would be an opportunity. Uh, feel free to just open your chat. I don't see anyone. Okay, let me know. We'll come back uh, if needed. Uh, moving in the briefing session or with quorum, we'll uh, first approve. I see two media minutes. Oh, we had two weeks in a row within. Okay. Uh, so can I hear a motion to hear approve both January so 21st? Moved. Okay, thank you. And January 27th. Second. All right. We're on it today. Uh, any comments or edits? Okay. Hearing none, if not, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed nay? Extensions? Okay, so approved. Thank you. Um, and we'll move straight into our city council report with our new city council liaison. Thank you. And it, again, it's really nice to be back. I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, and I'm especially pleased, Joanne, right to see you because uh, you were coming on as I was going on. So uh, it's a great day. Uh, you. I shared with you um, the, the uh, Chris Becker's analysis. Let me get to that uh, because I think it's important when we talk about affordable housing that we are looking at a bigger picture. And if you had a chance to read um, her report, 2020 was the sixth most successful year in terms of uh, permitting and pulling um, both multifamily and um, and then to a certain extent, single family. And we hear from those who are in the industry, home builders, realtors, and so forth, that we have a housing crisis, which indeed we do. We, we don't have enough housing, but it's important to keep that in context. And I urge you to look at it and look at her um, PowerPoint so that you can get a kind of a, a snapshot of what we're considering as we move forward with housing. The council has adopted a 100 day plan for all of us going forward. And I will send that to you uh, later, but I just wanted to reference some of it. A lot of it is focused on housing. Um, we're looking at recruiting and seating a housing, housing advisory subcommittee. Um, signing a contract with a land bank consultant, certainly dealing with accessory dwelling unit rules and um, something that has really plagued me for some time and working with the administration around short-term rentals, so Airbnbs and so forth, because the hotel industry will say, they are not following the rules. They're not, they are regulated, but they're not um, taking out business licenses, they're not properly insured. And there's a whole host of issues that aren't being addressed. And we estimate there could be as many as 3,000 within the city um, that aren't following the rules. Those are, those are dwellings that are being taken out of circulation, if you will, for people to actually buy or rent long term. So if they're going to do that, they need to be following the rules. So 
Um, that's something that I uh, will be working on with administration. A lot of the things as well, be, I'm always focused on public safety and um, making sure that we continue to be vigilant around property crime and um, homeless issues that they're not really homeless issues, they're um, criminal issues, and we often conflate the two. So I wanna make sure that we're focusing on the right things when we talk about um, homelessness and housing homeless, we're not talking about criminality. So um, those are some of the things I'm focusing on. As I said, I will send this to you. I urge you to look at it if you have questions, if you have comments, and I, I know I presented to the CA, um, was it last week? Time flies, yes. And urge them as well to contact council if you have questions or if you think something needs more attention than perhaps we're giving it. So I'm open to questions if you have questions. Quick, Council Member Kinnear, which PowerPoint presentation did you reference at the beginning of your uh, comments? Chris Becker, um, there was a, uh, Jackie Churchill sent out a um, link or a, yeah, that Chris Becker sent to us and it has a PowerPoint attached to it. This and is the you, urban experience meeting? Yeah, yeah. So I urge you to look at that. Um, and in the context of the discussion that we're having right now around housing issues, I think it's important to keep everything in perspective. Thank you. If you didn't get that PowerPoint, we'll try and resend it. I think I mean, we're just looking at it right now. It just came out this afternoon, right? Yes. Jackie, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Um, okay, moving on to uh, if you have community assembly liaison report, please, Mary. Um, yeah, this is Mary. Uh, I don't have that much. I do have a question though. Um, there's a, a C when is the next CTAB meeting? I can answer um, that. Um, that. That is the yeah. uh, the seventeenth. At what time? Well, that I can't answer. Well, I can the reason I'm this. asking is is that they sent sent out something about 37th and Ray and traffic calming and traffic issues, and I think it's at the very very same time as CTAB, which I don't think is a good idea. I I know I need to be at both, but and I don't know how to split myself. But um, and are are the planning people and the office of neighborhood services connecting as far as calendars go? I guess that's generally my question. Um, Mary. Yeah. I just pulled it up. Five thirty p.m. on the seventeenth. Okay, it is the very same time. Uh, so I don't know if Lewis can do anything about that. Or if Lewis is even here. Oh, there, yeah, he is. I can bring that up to the project staff. Inga's in a different department. It's a different department leading that study, so. Well, that's that's why I was thinking that it kind of got siloed and it makes it awkward. So whatever you can do about that, I would be grateful. And that's all I have right this second. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, President Report, uh, a lot of this was things I want I would like to comment on related to housing and, and action going on in Olympia. We can probably cover in our board business and workshops today since we, uh, since we have a nice variety. Um, maybe I'll announce and then let Lewis follow up. Uh, everyone uh, should have received uh, a letter of resignation from from Diana today, so that's unfortunate. But what I, but I think you can read into the letter that we're we should all be grateful and excited that for 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 her service, but also that she's moving into a leadership role with uh, spoken preservation advocates. So I, I think that's you know I, I suspect we'll have plenty of interaction with with Diana in the, in the next year. So thank you for her service. Um, I'll let Lewis discuss a little bit more about um, our conversations over the last few days on on our, our interviews with our applicants and the timelines on that. 
Uh, one thing I will maybe comment on, and I, I see um, uh, Mr. McClatchy on, you know, if we can again request, you know, have block out some time maybe during session, just even if it's 10 minutes to discuss recent updates on on some of the action in Olympia. I follow many of them many very closely uh, with my other role on the state building code council, but you know, a couple a couple of the environmental, you know, GMA. This is the climate, the climate change, you know, inclusion in the GMA, you know, some of those are moving forward. A lot of them related to energy and so forth that are, are, are going to be uh, impactful and, and, and relevant to, as we talk about types of housing, uh, even today, single family versus multifamily. Uh, you know, if you follow those very closely, those, um, you know, the, the advocates for and against are, 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 are very closely related to the types of construction for housing and it's an all above you know all of the above situation in my in my opinion but we we need to be aware of that from a planning standpoint just as we are from a construction and, and design standpoint so uh with that uh let's circle back during our during our other sessions and and i'll pass it on to uh cliff for the transportation subcommittee report please Cliff, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Maybe. Hello. There we go. Can you hear me? We can now. Thank you, Cliff. Okay. Uh, the transportation subcommittee uh, voted Mary Winks as vice chair. Uh, the PCTS subcommittee is a subcommittee of the plan commission and they can modify our, uh, our rules, but at this point in time, uh, we have an issue. Uh, there's only one, uh, city council member who should be on the committee. And that is Lori Kinnear, who's the liaison with the plan commission. Uh, she's a real member of the subcommittee and she doesn't have voting rights. So if the plan commission wants to change that or organizations, uh, it's up to us to do so. Uh, the next one is the street program, was, six year street program was presented and it's on today's agenda. Uh, the uh, integrated capital management uh, talked about the Ray and Freya alternative that Mary mentioned earlier, and that's for North South traffic at Ferris High School. And one of the interesting parts of that uh, is the fact that one of the alternatives is a roundabout, and this roundabout would include regular autos, student drivers, yes. and also ADA compliant issues. So testimony on this alternative might be interesting uh, for uh, future design high traffic, pedestrian or people powered intersections. Um, we're trying to increase uh, our open communication so that uh, commission members and the public can find these projects quickly on the plan commission subcommittee. Integrated capital management, uh, the manager has agreed to present an integrated capital project matrix scoring at the CTS meeting. Um, there's a PowerPoint on the internet uh, under the Drop off. Cliff, are you there? I, his phone dropped off. I see he, he was calling user two. Okay, well let's let's come back while while we're waiting for him. If you can come back in the next ten seconds or so, uh, my question is is re regarding the rule change that Cliff is proposing. Am I wrong? My understanding was that was in the transportation subcommittee's rules of procedure, which are up to the subcommittee to change, not in the plan commission rules. Is, can anyone give clarity on that? I think we should ask James Richmond to clarify for us. Okay. 
I apologize. I, <clears throat> my boss called me, so I was visiting with him, so I sort of missed part of that uh, conversation. Um, I think I weighed in on this earlier, and, and I think that if the subcommittee wishes to amend its rules, that I guess it would be appropriate for them to do so by, by motion. Yeah, that, that was my understanding, but we can circle back. We don't need to solve it here, but I just well, think that, that yeah. raised that question that I don't think it's a plan commission rule change. Uh, yes, go ahead, Mary. Uh, the, the question came up because uh, somehow or other uh, um, council member Cathcart was introduced or listed as the liaison from city council to uh, the subcommittee, which as far as I know, he is not that uh, a full member, a full member without voting privileges, the way the uh, rules are written right now would be council member Kinnear. Yeah, so that, that was the confusion. If I could explain, I think what happened was when we were approving our committee assignments, the plan commission and that transportation subcommittee were separated. And, and so council member Cathcart was assigned to that. Uh, then I was assigned to the plan commission. So I think it was, it was in the, as we did went through our process, I think that that was how it happened. So this so, Lori, has that been straightened out on your end then now? Um, not quite. So that's why I need to speak with James and see if we can't um, figure that out. We've already done our committee assignments for the year, so um, I think we'll need to talk to James and then um, council president to figure out how we move forward. Yeah, from my perspective, this isn't something that really needs to be addressed in the, in the subcommittee's rules of procedure. Because I think it's sort of within the city council's uh, realm to to uh, make appointments and uh, determine the makeup of these committees. Actually, not. It's in the rules of the subcommittee. I think what James is saying is it's ultimately up to the council. Yes, and I don't think that it needs to be addressed in the subcommittee's rules. It is, but it does, I don't think it needs to be. It may be sort of inappropriate to have it there. Okay, well, I, I think uh, I just want to raise that question on plan commission versus transportation subcommittee rules. So I, I think everyone is, is kind of aware and we'll circle back on that. So, okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, I don't see, we'll move on and I don't see Cliff back on on the call. So, okay, uh, moving into the secretary report, please, Mr. Mueller. I don't have a lot to share. Uh, I know the administration is going to be re-advertising the planning director position soon within the next couple of weeks, along with our division director position. So we'll have two uh, within our division uh, being recruited for soon. And I, I think I'll stop there at this point. Um, I will also say that uh, Mr. Baker was reappointed to a full term. And so he will be uh, remaining on the plan commission. And with Diana Painter's resignation today, uh, we now have two empty positions and I guess I could go into committee business, uh, commission business, if we'd like to begin discussion about formation of a subcommittee uh, of up to three plan commission members to do the, an interview process of uh, potential applicants coming up here in the next couple of weeks. And so I'd like to discuss, have the plan commission discuss that. Um, what we have done a, a bit of a survey of other boards and commissions and they're moving and they're moving forward with, uh, in this fashion rather than bringing them forward before the whole body so that they can have a very intimate detailed discussion with applicants. Uh, Lewis, are they then going to go ahead, they, Joanne. Go are, ahead. They, um, are they then going to come forward to the whole commission or just the subcommittee? It would just stay at a subcommittee level. Other commissions and boards have been moving to have uh, their leadership from that board or commission, and then maybe a general member uh, participate in these interviews and, and then forwarding uh, general recommendations to the mayor, who then makes a, uh, recommended appointees to the city council for approval. Okay. So while I'm here, I'm going to announce I, I uh, got a new job. I got tired of retirement. I didn't like it at all. And so I went to work out at Alliance Store Products out in the valley. They're a wholesaler and a manufacturer of doors, and these doors are beautiful, by the way. But I am, they, they, um, they um, are just a super nice company, and they have said, hey, yeah, you can go ahead and stay on the plan commission. So 
left early today. You know, I'm only like a week and a half into my position and I left early to come home and do this. Um, there's probably going to be a few times though, where, you know, I may be late or not make it, but, uh, they're being very, very supportive. So anyway, I wanted to let you know that, but, um, you're not going to have another opening on the plan commission anyway. So it, that's good. <laughs> well, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, thank you. I, I was going to add before I was on mute. There is a little more commentary if, if you think it's appropriate. Uh, we. The question was, you might have seen the agenda change today. We were going to conduct, um, you know, discussion. I want to call it a discussion, not necessarily an interview with the commission. But the question was raised by by both a commissioner and and perhaps one of the applicants on on what the real process was here. And I, I think it exposed that we could probably we probably should be more formal and and make sure that we also um, were appropriate when in the public forum on on interacting with with the you know with the, the applicants J just as a reminder and correct me if i'm if i get anything incorrect here james or, or lewis you know our bill our the history of interviewing applicants before they go to the mayor is really a courtesy extended in my understanding from the mayor the mayor nominates the council um um what would be the correct term appoints and and really you know, it's up to our elected officials to make this decision. So we we thank thank them for the opportunity to just you know to meet them before. But um, and since we've only in the past, in my experience, only had a few applicants, it's always been more of an interaction between the commission and the applicant for them to ask questions for us that you know it, you know get to meet them. And I, I think it, it became a little awkward when we started to, if we went into some sort of deliberation about qualifications in public. So it's really it's it's really an attempt to be more aligned with the other boards and commissions and 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 perhaps be a little protect the applicants a little more. Todd, Todd, could I could I add something? Please, please. Um, I, while I agree, you know that it can be awkward when you are discussing somebody in public. I think it. We take your recommendation, the council takes your recommendation seriously. I guess I would ask that those who would be making the, the choice would vet the people very carefully and ask some probing questions. We have a really good group on plan commission now, thorough and knowledgeable, and it would be great if we could keep up that high standard so I would ask that the people who are going to be chosen um, do their their interview process very thoughtfully and make sure that they're actually getting the very best that they can. Because this is a huge job. There's a big time commitment. So we want to make sure that we're getting people who are going to make that commitment. Thank uh, you for that. Go ahead, Mary. Uh, well, I my first time watching this. It was last time and I was trying, I think I even mentioned that I thought it was kind of odd to be talking about people in the public record with them right there. Um, because I, my, my background, one of them, I've got a master's in human resources and I did interviewing for 42 years uh, throughout the, um, well, through the state system and, and in, uh, well, in Gonzaga too, but uh, I, I was, kind of surprised there wasn't a standard set of questions that were asked of every candidate. It seemed like it was just kind of all over the place. And I I am so used to seeing a standard set of questions asked of everyone so you have some point of comparison. And uh, besides doing a smaller group to do the interview, I would suggest that there be a standard set of questions developed. Thank you for the input. Yes, and you know, again, in, in, I, I could see that as a, as a strong recommendation. I, you know, in the past, I really saw the opportunity. You know, of course, give feedback, but but really, you know, because the applicants are coming in and trying to better understand, I, I can say from my experience, I, I didn't fully understand, you know, procedures and and the responsibilities of the commission, and I really wanted to ask questions. You know, I. Uh, as, when I when I was and understand what I was volunteering for, right, applying for. So well, that, doesn't, some, that yeah. doesn't preclude doing that. Correct. Right. Exactly. So let's let's talk about it more. So um, as a commission, and and then and then 
formed a subcommittee. Now, under our rules, uh, forming a subcommittee, I think, uh, is is under the ability of the president to form. Obviously, we're doing this together. Uh, so, if 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 everyone agrees to that, uh, um, the proposal is to put together a subcommittee of three. Uh, we discussed having the president, um, one person representing the president and vice president. So, Greg or I will 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 join that. Uh, we can take volunteers or nominations and, and just settle it right here. Um, I would like to nominate Joanne if if if, if you're willing, but uh, I want to, of course, let you respond, especially now that you just announced your uh, other time commitments. <laughs> well, I'd love, I'd love to be on this committee if we could do it uh, like after like four, four okay. thirty. If we could if we could arrange that, it'd be great. And I could, then I could do it, and I wouldn't have to leave work early, so that'd be great. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And then let's leave the third position. Anyone like to uh, volunteer now, preferably not a requirement, but someone who's been on the commission a little longer to understand the deeper understanding of the procedural side, but. I, and I don't see uh, Sylvie here today. That's. I'm sure. Oh, you are good. Been here since the beginning. All right. I see you. Sylvia, would, is there something you might be interested in? Not to put you on the spot, but putting you on the spot? Depends on how much time it involves. Well, we do have six applicants, I believe, right? So mm -hmm. it's not nothing. Yeah, if there's nobody else. <laughs> well, I think you're well qualified. So if, everyone, if you're willing and everyone agrees to that, then we'll set it there. Is that okay? Yeah, can you do you think you can arrange after to have that this uh, going on around four four yeah. thirty or something? Okay. I, I think we're we should okay. be flexible like that. But right. Also, okay. be insensitive to the applicant. So, thank you. Somebody yeah. will let us know when and where, right? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you, Lewis. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Uh, then we'll move into board business. So uh, we are slotted here. We're right on time. Uh, 233, we're going to um, follow up from our, uh, our discussion, with our, our meeting with the council uh, regarding the work program. And, and my understanding as we left it, and Lewis, I can, I can defer to you if you'd like to introduce Deuce, this, but I'll just set it up that my memory leaving this with the council was that we would um, leave a proxy in the, in the work program for some of the issues we're going to discuss about housing that we would defer uh, some of that that work towards to uh, another subcommittee focus on housing. So maybe I'll, I'll hand it over to you, Lewis, if you'd like to discuss that more. Yeah, that's exactly right. So this draft that's in your packet today has a couple placeholders for items that were talked about, and we plan on ho uh, having the subcommittee of plan commission members meet with city council to flesh that item out in further detail here very soon. We're going to have quite a few different. Uh, projects coming up where there's going to be a lot of interaction with council uh, to deep dive on the housing action plan. Also, the housing action plan will be at the um, city council study session uh, for about the next month, deep diving into this. And I think this plan commission subcommittee and the council subcommittee can dialogue about placeholders and also uh, the 100 day plan pieces that the council resolution has passed. And I seem to remember it was proposed as three and three, correct? And then is the assumption there that we're because we're all so well versed weekly or, or every other week on the housing action plan that we don't need further representation, or we will we will have staff available. The housing action plan will be coming separate uh, um, as needed to the plan commission and to the city council as that. Can the uh, dialogue continues around the actions that are within that. Okay. So I don't think we need any further involvement there. Okay. Um, was our intent here to perhaps pull up just the list one more time? It's in our packet and then and then dialogue a little more about this. Yeah, my intent today was to see if there were any other changes. Otherwise, we will forward this to the city council. I can pull it up for you. Thank you. And I assume this this is the I, it seems to be the same as we looked at with the council, correct? 
It is the exact same as you'll see here. We added this housing policy implementation placeholder item to represent that. That is new from what we dialogued with city council. So this represents everything that we have either underway or plan on starting and a rough time frame of when it will be under plan commission review, possible hearing within this quarter, and then when we would be forwarding it to city council for their adoption and dialogue. So, I really, uh, go ahead. I really expect there to probably be uh, two paths forward on housing policy implementation. Uh, one, after the adoption of the housing action plan, I expect there will be a follow on project with that and a prioritization from council and plan commission on what those items are. And then we could get going on a more immediate uh, project tied to the council's 100 day plan and, and the subcommittee. So one question I have, I'll start out here is um, this is kind of, this is a catch all. And as we get into the housing action plan discussion here today, of course, it, that leads with a, 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 you know, a good diagram of how the housing action plan informs both short term policy. And I think, I think we've, I, Liz, I think you framed it well last time you say things that are within implementation within the current comp plan and things that might be actual discussions within the comp plan, whether they happen on a yearly amendment or some other mechanism, or simply are, we start the discussion now for, for the, you know, the periodic update in a, in a, in a few years, but is the intent that that would, those options would all be captured under this one housing policy catch all. I think that would fall underneath that implementation of housing action plan. So if that had items in there that come out as a priority in a in an implementation matrix for things that were either comprehensive plan related possible changes needed or uh, code changes that already fit within the comprehensive plan, I'm seeing the uh, the placeholder right now is probably more immediate items that uh, maybe council desires. But I think it's up to this subcommittee, the plan commission, and council to dialogue about that. Okay, I, I know I'm a strong advocate for this, so I'd like to hear other commissioners, you know, input on that, that option of having top plan discussions. And we can get specific about talking about which which ones if, you, if you'd like, but I'd hate to have not have that boxed out if, um, but I think what I'm hearing, Lewis, is in, in your view that that has to be come out of housing action plan, or could there be some other trigger that we would have that, that type of discussion? And the other triggers would be, these are relevant discussions happening in Olympia, these are so forth, uh, you know, do we really, can it only come out of the housing action plan? I don't think it only, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily only have to come out of the housing action plan, but I think in the next couple months, the housing action plan is gonna be the, the biggest focus around housing issues and uh, priorities coming out of that. Uh, with the community too, not just plan commission council, but with the broader um, participants that are a part of that planning effort. Craig, please. Um, while I agree with the housing policy implementation placeholder, because you know we've talked about that subcommittee, and I think that's a good approach to figure out I think more detail around housing. I'm going to be an advocate here for my my little pet project, and I I would like to see ADU reform specifically called out. I know, I believe there's support for that on the commission. Uh, there's support for that, obviously on the sustainability action subcommittee, and that doesn't mean much in the context of here. But I know there's been a lot of internal advocacy around. ADU reform, and so I'd like to see it specifically called out on the work plan without uh, having to wait for that subcommittee. And I'll agree on the, the the comp plan discussion, but I do think that it probably falls under kind of that phase one of the housing action plan that we 
I think that could lead to a lot of that discussion about where we go with the comp plan with regards to housing coming out of that initial discussion there. Yeah, I agree. And maybe, maybe that's a good, you know, maybe we can reserve some of that discussion today for the housing action plan. So maybe if, 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 we, if we tie this up pretty quickly here on the work plan, and then we'll park some of those comp plan proposals to the housing action plan discussion in, in a little bit here. Um, but I agree the ADU does seem like it fits under the implementation placeholder. Is everyone in agreement on that? I mean, I'm thinking of adding it specifically outside of the implementation placeholder. So put it on the work plan now. And, and maybe there's further items that come out of that implementation placeholder discussion with that subcommittee. But I think there's enough support on both plan commission and city council to specifically put ADU reform on the work plan specifically. Okay. Well, and maybe we'll we'll, we'll ask our council, council liaison here too. So I think what we're uh, meeting, the way I interpreted it, we have this authorization <laughs> to help and put that place placeholder on there, right? And then we're gonna ultimately the council is gonna take action on this. This is their you know approval. Are you could it be a, a, a bullet point underneath that placeholder or a couple of the key areas that that sure. our recommendations sure. are that, that might be the most relevant right now? And, and since we know it's yeah. already on the hundred day plan, that's Probably a winner. And and I would just caution everyone that um, and Greg, I don't know what you mean by reform. So um, keeping in mind that neighborhoods such as Rockwood would be prime candidates for ADUs. So you need to be. Uh, there are some unintended consequences, and we need to be very careful as we go forward. What we're looking at, I, I think, um, when Heather Troutman was here. As a plan director, she was talking about doing um, other things such as permitting duplexes on corners, even in a residential single family neighborhood. So there are lots of things that we consider ADU can certainly be one of them, but not to the exclusion of other things and some things that may be low hanging fruit that we haven't identified yet. So I would just don't limit yourself is all I'd say. Oh, and and I, I certainly don't think that we're limiting ourselves if we call talk about ADU, I'll call it review of the existing development code around ADUs. I, I think there's lots of opportunities around uh, housing reform that we uh, should look at, but I think there's been a, a lot of interest in ADU reform and I'll, I'll call it reform. Sorry, I'm stuck on the reform word. <laughs> I'm, and I, to me, the, the whole purpose of the planning commission and city council process is to ensure that it's well vetted out with the public. So, and I think we need to be very cognizant of that. Yeah, I would agree. I would say that not everyone on council is going to be um, jumping up and down and waving flags about ADUs. There's some concern on council as well. So it's not, a, uh, you know, seven of us going, yay, ADUs. So just be aware that there's going to be a lot of conversation around that. And when we look at um, the limitations right now, just the cost alone of building, if you wanted to put on a bedroom on your house, the cost is ridiculous. So imagine building a whole new structure on your property. So it just, we need to, I would like to really pursue some low hanging fruit as well. Um, it, in addition to ADUs, so things that that people could do immediately and not have to wait um, until we're out of an economic crisis before we pursue some of these things. Well, uh, Lewis, wouldn't this kind of then go back to um, the like implementation measures and kind of prioritizing those as to um, you know fit in just to address what Lori's just talking about? I mean, what's What's low hanging fruit and what we can do right now and um so do you have a little bit of guidance on that i mean i is adus is it that important to everybody that we've talked to so far to have that up at the top of the list or not uh it's on the city councils and it was just sent out uh recently the 100 day plan from council so i think that gives you some idea of their 
you know, adopted priorities within that resolution. Okay. Um, and so I think there's something we could get going on relatively soon. And then there is going to be very thorough discussion and a lot of community input on uh, what measures to take in the housing action plan and hopefully a prioritization coming out of that, of what we should tackle first in the housing action plan. So some of that would naturally naturally follow the adoption of the housing action plan, which should be hopefully by July 1, that'll be done. You know, maybe I'll propose here that um, since I think we're getting into some of the discussion we can have in the housing action plan, maybe we can gain a little time here and then put a little more on the back end of the housing action plan discussion here. And and because I I also personally would love to like to discuss in that context of implementation. I'm going to call it FAR reform, lot coverage reform. And I think all of those need to be discussed in in context, and then the and then the piece that would be out of implementation. I'd like to have a serious discussion, um, like Seattle did, on terminology on single family, which also might start to get into 1.3 and 1.4 discussion, which is clearly comp plan um, amendment discussion. So um, maybe if everyone's okay with that, should we should we park that for now? Is there anything else on the work program beyond saying we we Support that line item implementation piece. Um, I, I guess I would argue that we, I'd like to see a line item comp plan uh, piece, but but maybe let's come back to that. Okay. Any other comments before we? I guess. To I'd like us yeah. to just add add ADU and add comp plan as desires of the plan commission on there and then move it forward to council and for them to build the dialogue about that. Okay. Well well if that's the case, if we if we wanted to put specific implementation pieces in, I I would like to propose that we add FAR and and we as soon as you open that up, you have to have some discussion about Lot coverage, of course, together, but but really FAR would be, you know, the key bullet point there. And if everyone, um, I'll, I'll be a little more specific. FAR as more of a as a measure of of how we control massing. Uh, it's going to open up discussions about design guidelines, so forth. But there are proposals in other cities on how you use FAR plus bonus incentives for certain measures and that's another opportunity there for you know ways to discuss preservation or ways to be more specific about corner lots alley lots you know uh so forth that there there, there could be certain bonuses for passive I, house. Thought, I think you're getting way in the weeds also we're looking for kind of a broad subject that we could then scope out um in detail you know with the plan commission going forward so you're looking for an ADU line item, and we're looking for a single family zone um, allowance line item or all zones. Well, specifically the, the single family terminology is um, when we, the, the term single family is baked into the comp plan that it can be, it should be a single family type environment. Right, the so terminology, there, sorry, go ahead. Well, there could be an allowance to allow more development in a, in with consistent with the single family policy, or we could have a dialogue about chucking the single family policy. You know, I think those are two different things. So yeah. where, are you, where are you going with that? I think there's two different things. There's one, just simply the terminology. This is what Seattle took on that. The terminology is just as is not, is not accurate. Right. As soon as we start allowing ADUs on single on, we're no longer doing one unit per or parcel, right? And even if we start subdividing into pocket residential, so forth, or if we do cottage, you know, it just gets technically incorrect, right? So there's, there's that piece. Then there, of course, there's the historical piece on, you know, single family zoning, exclusionary, so forth. So there's other reasons why you would open up that is about just the terminology and just say neighborhood residential, regardless of any changes beyond that, right? But that's a comp plan proposal. Then there's the actual discussion about about the the more the, the specific implementation pieces of FAR and so forth, lot coverage that we're getting in the weeds in right here that we're not going to solve over 
the next 10 minutes. Yeah. Well, and two, if we could go back and look at, because we voted on this, right? So how did that all turn out? I mean, I, I think we should kind of prioritize whatever we want to do based on that, because we've already talked about that, so. Yeah, I'm not at a loss. Okay, let's let's come back to. I really think we should hear the update from from Aaron today, and then have a discussion after. Okay, that's okay. Okay. Okay, so that that puts us a little early. Um, is, if everyone's okay, then we'll move into our workshop, and our first item would be the Fifth Avenue Initiative. Are we too early to do, to open that up? Do we have everyone available uh, to discuss that? Looks like we have an error on the agenda. We'd like that item to have an extra ten minutes, so it'll go twenty minutes, so it could use this extra time. Okay. Marn, do you want to? Yes. Hello. Um. Hi, Commission President and Commissioners. Uh, my name is Maren Murphy, and I'm a planner here at the city. Um, thank you for having us today to talk about the Fifth Avenue initiative. Um, I'm trying to share my screen. I just saved my presentation. Of course, there's a lot of pictures, so it took a very long time. But let me pull up my screen to share. We have a brief presentation that we're going to go over. Um, and maybe while I'm doing that, I will also welcome uh, Reverend Lonnie Mitchell, uh, who's joining us. He's been part of our project team for the Fifth Avenue Initiative. And um, I can invite him to share a brief introduction and his connection to the project. And then once I get this up and going, um, then we can start. So Lonnie. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Maureen. And uh, thank you, Plan Commission, uh, for just giving us this opportunity to uh, share with you um, you know, the community engagement uh, in the uh, Fifth Avenue uh, area and how we might um, uh, be able to uh, partner with the city uh, in doing some great things. So uh, thank you. Thank you once again for just allowing us to uh, present our case and I uh, hope that you can, um, yeah, just uh, get behind it. Thank you. So the initiative is a neighborhood driven effort in partnership with the city to reimagine East 5th Avenue in the East Central neighborhood. And the project outcome has been a community strategy that provides actions for improvements, programming, and community building uh, along the 5th Avenue corridor. And um, I shared a link to the, our project page as well as the draft community strategy in the briefing paper. Uh, I think it's also in the full strategies in the agenda as well. So from the beginning, the 5th Avenue initiative focused on inclusion and reflecting the diversity of the community. And this is a list of many of the key stakeholders that participated. Uh, we deeply appreciate everyone's time, energy, and focus on the 5th Avenue initiative um, and their, their participation in the conversation. So the project focused um, along the 5th Avenue corridor, as you can see on this map, uh, from Liberty Park to roughly the uh, Thor Freya uh, from east west, and then the freeway to the um, kind of natural uh, uh, breaks there with the bluff. A few community highlights there's about 2,400 residents in this area. And the nice thing for a data nerd is that this area um, lines up with a one census tract, so we were able to get some really good uh, numbers. Um, uh, in a pretty consistent area. So, uh, but there are 2,400 residents, just over a thousand housing units, about 54% of them are owner occupied, which is actually similar to the city overall. Uh, the median household income is uh, close to $41,000 a year, which is a bit lower than the city's overall, which I think is a little bit closer to 50,000 as of recent. Um, it is also one of the most racially and ethnically diverse areas of Spokane, which the community views as a strength and an important part of their legacy and identity. Um, but also to note that the roots in this diversity um, are through a history of inequality. And I'm going to share a little bit about the history of the neighborhood to start as it is an important factor to many of the challenges faced today. And it's also a reason why the initiative came about as one way to heal from the inequities and the impacts caused to the neighborhood and the residents over time. So it is a really important part of um, kind of the project moving forward. 
So the East Central neighborhood was established as a working class area in the 1890s, and the families that settled there worked in mining, logging, timber, railroad, to name a few. Uh, many were relatively recent immigrants, and that made for uh, the neighborhood diverse from uh, one of the most diverse areas in the city from its inception. Uh, in the beginning of the early, early, early 20th century, the neighborhood experienced economic declines post World War I, which decreased land values. And again, this led to the inequalities that were furthered by housing discrimination, displacement, and conditions of disinvestment over time. But without, throughout all of that and throughout the history of the area, East Central's remained home to thousands of families and hundreds of businesses and uh, many of which employ residents in the area. So one of the biggest inequalities was redlining and housing discrimination. And we've talked a bit about this in our housing action plan. Um, so it's kind of a unique way to look at one particular area and the impacts of redlining uh, on, on a particular area. And as a reminder, in the 1930s, the federal backed homeowners loan corporation graded neighborhoods to evaluate the risk the riskiness of home mortgages, and this was based in large part on their racial makeup. Uh, so green is the highest grade on this map and red is the lowest grade. I put a, a box, uh, the orange box is around the Fifth Avenue area. Um, so banks and mortgage lenders limited or refused investment in and in near African American and other minority neighborhoods, and that's what was primarily rated the yellow and the red. So technically the Fifth Avenue area is rated as the third grade here in the yellow, but in the clarifying remarks, uh, if you can read it, um, it states that the area is on the verge of being fourth grade and is assigned a very low yellow grade due to the um, heterogeneous character of the neighborhood, uh, meaning its diversity and further called the area hazardous. So this limited investment uh, in the Fifth Avenue area as well as many other areas in our city uh, that were graded similarly and furthered segregation by concentrating African-American families and immigrant families and lower income households. So the redlining and um, was ultimately uh, prohibited in the 60s with the Fair Housing Act of 1968, but the impacts of it are still felt in neighborhoods uh, both in Spokane as well as across the country. This was not unique to Spokane, unfortunately. Um, and so that's where um, kind of a lot of the inequities we see um, beginning to come from. In the 1950s, as highway planning and construction became a national priority, the East Central neighborhood became the focus of the development of Interstate 90. And that was again following uh, disinvestment and the low, low land values. And this followed a national practice where many highways were built in overwhelmingly poor, poor black and diverse neighborhoods. So again, not unique to Spokane, but we also had it here too. And the construction of Interstate 90 leveled thousands of homes in the East Central neighborhood. Um, some schools closed and businesses were struggling uh, both on the Sprague corridor as well as along the Fifth Avenue corridor. And Liberty Park shown here in these images was, was the oldest and one of the most elaborate parks in the city and it's just a really striking visual representation of um, the impact of Interstate 90. It drastically reduced the size of the park from 26 acres to two acres. So it took uh, most of the park away. And obviously the city and um, WashDOT have been working on mitigating that over the years, but the culturally the freeway created two neighborhoods the north of the freeway along Sprague and south of the freeway in, in the Fifth Avenue area. Of course, we know it as the East Central neighborhood still, but the history is really important because it does provide the backdrop for many of the challenges that the neighborhood faces. And it's also really relevant for the residents today who still feel the trauma of these inequalities and the impacts of the neighborhood. Um, it, it came up in, you know, in all of the stakeholder meetings and um, is was really eye opening to hear firsthand how many people still feel impacted by uh, by these decisions, you know, decades later. So um, I just wanted to go over that as kind of the backdrop for where we're heading today. And um, 
to talk about that, I want to invite uh, Reverend Mitchell a bit more to share about the area, and then we can share the overall priorities in the draft strategy. Thank you, Maureen. And um, you know, one of the things that um, that that really impresses me uh, about this area is that's just a lot of potential um, uh, for us to uh, to move in and make it a a really uh, welcoming um, 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 uh, community. And uh, so, you know, uh, uh, Michael Brown, uh, his um, uh, his uh, Fresh Soul restaurant uh, is is new to the area. And of course, um, uh, Larry Roseman's uh, barbershop, barbershop has been there for years, and uh, and of course we um, we have just um, uh, brought in the Martin Luther King Center to uh, um, to occupy uh, the East Central Community Center, and um, and that is going very well and uh, being very very um, um, impactful uh, to our community. Uh, to to sort of uh, where uh, people uh, who normally would not uh, even uh, be able to uh, gather would be able to gather at the Martin Luther King Center. So all of these things here are, are, are really uh, helping us to move forward. And uh, and of course, we look forward to the um, the plan committee, the uh, the city uh, to partner with us. And uh, one of the things that I want to build on is the momentum uh, of uh, community engagement and uh, where people are very, very excited about building um, uh, building this area. And so we're looking forward to some great um, work ahead of us and uh, hope that uh, we can get uh, the plan commission. Uh, I'm just clicking through a few of the images uh, from, from um, the area today. Also of note is the uh, the East Central Library is being um, rebuilt in Liberty Park, and that will be a really great catalyst project. Um, and I, you know, it's under construction, hopefully will be completed within the year. So, um, and then a couple other transportation related projects. Uh, there was a recent um, electrification grant that went around, that went out um, citywide. Uh, to install um, fast charging plugs at 51 strategic locations throughout the county. And the uh, East Central neighborhood was selected as one of those locations around, I believe, Fred Meyer. Um, so that's a really cool investment. And then also with the North Spokane corridor, um, it, the terminus or the junction will be around East Central and um, the Fifth Avenue, well, not towards the Fifth Avenue area, but, you know, around Freya, Thor, um, along Third Avenue. And then also there's the Children of the Sun Trail that will connect into the Ben Burr Trail and provide uh, additional access to area um, trails and networks and um, transportation. So a couple other exciting projects. So the process builds on uh, previous discussions that were have been going on and off for a number of years. Um, we re-engaged the community in 2019 with a small project team, uh, and we had three stakeholder meetings over a course of a couple months, and then two community late 2019 and early 2020. And we developed the draft strategy in February of 2020. You can see our last community forum was on February 22nd. So, you know, mere weeks before COVID-19 um, reared its ugly head and we entered into the pandemic. Um, so it was put on pause for a little bit of time while uh, city council uh, was focusing and, and the city efforts, the efforts were focusing on the response. And the effort now is to uh, consider the draft strategy and um, hopefully work it through to adoption and help recognize the community's efforts and their vision for this area. So a few press images from the process. We had really great discussions um, with stakeholders and we were able to do a lot of community activities around brainstorming and prioritizing Looking at these photos, it feels so long ago being in a room yeah. with other people, <laughs> but we were, and it was really great. Um, and actually, Council Member Wilkerson was part of our stakeholder group prior to her being elected. So it was really cool to kind of see 
uh, her progress throughout that. Um, but again, some really great conversations, some really open and honest conversations throughout the process um, and um, some nice press around it as well. And at one of the meetings, we asked stakeholders to share words that communicate their vision for the Fifth Avenue. And so this is a word cloud of the different words that came up and you can see there's a lot of vision here, um, things like empowering, connected, safe, affordable, uh, even revolution. So the, as uh, Reverend Mitchell stated, the community really wants Fifth Avenue to be an area of opportunity for current residents and future residents while also being an inviting place for people from all over the area to come and visit. So that's really uh, what, what is driving and um, you know, what they'd like to see come out of this. The draft community strategy outlines um, six priorities and um, I'm not gonna go through all of them. They are in the plan with a lot more detail, but again, kind of following the vision, the vision words um, that I shared on the previous slide, the priorities speak to defining the Fifth Avenue identity further. Um, that's really coming from, again, the feeling of what is Fifth Avenue within the East Central neighborhood, knowing that the East Central neighborhood is quite large. So what is the Fifth Avenue identity? What is its place within that? Uh, promoting coordination among all the providers and stakeholders, improving the streetscape. There have been a number of improvements uh, over the last couple of years and how can we continue to build on that. Uh, preserving and expanding housing affordability and um, prioritizing anti-displacement. It's kind of interesting because a lot of the conversations that we're now having in the housing action plan, we had similar conversations around Fifth Avenue, just at a much smaller scale, uh, but concerns around affordability, concerns around displacement were all um, came up within the Fifth Avenue initiative and we're seeing those concerns a play out on a larger uh, discussion with the housing action plan. Uh, and then other priorities around uh, neighborhood commercial opportunities, continuing to support the vibrant commercial opportunities and grow those, and then protecting and enhancing the parks and, and trails. Uh, there are the two parks, Underhill Park and Liberty Park, and then the Ben Burr Trail, um, the Children of the Sun Trail, and very close to the Centennial Trail. So a lot of great connectivity and nature in the area. Um, so I guess before I go on, we just have uh, next steps wrapping up, but um, wanted to maybe pause and invite uh, Reverend Mitchell if you wanted to share anything or if any of the council or sorry, commissioners had any questions. Well, you know, uh, let me let me just just say this, um, Marion. And first of all, I want to thank the um, uh, the previous administration and this administration uh, for continuing on uh, the effort to um, do some great work in the East Central uh, area. Uh, we are uh, so grateful for um, uh, Lauren uh, Kinnear and, and Betsy Wilkerson, who are our uh, wonderful uh, council members uh, who continue to uh, work with us. Uh, we thank them for all of the work that they do. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, moving forward um, uh, on this um, initiative. Um, and, and one of the main things that we we're trying to do is also uh, to uh, showcase uh, the heritage uh, in, in the area, to maintain that heritage, uh, to move forward with some new ideas and new priorities, and to just, just allow this to be um, a welcoming and a uh, uh, a, a beautiful place uh, in the um, uh, in our city, and so we're just we're just uh, wanting to uh, sort of um, uh, uh, just um, uh, continue the momentum of um, of um, uh, community engagement uh, and 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 working through this. So uh, once again, uh, commissioners, we want to thank you so much uh, for your effort in uh, allowing us to uh, make this presentation and we look forward to uh, partnering with you to move forward. Thank you. Mark, I have a quick question. Yeah. Two things. Um, thank you, Reverend Lonnie, for that. I, I'm so supportive of that, this effort, and I wanna see it just thrive and blossom and grow. I would urge you to continue to work with our historic preservation officer 
Megan did well to make sure that it is a preservation of cultural heritage and that we're honoring the, the people that built this from the past because they deserve to be honored. The other quest, the question I have is, I've had many conversations with WashDOT. They do not intend to use all of the land where the houses have been removed. So I'm wondering if you all have had conversations with them and or pressured them to divulge what they can either sell or give back to the city to develop for either housing or open space that would benefit the community. You know, we, we've been working with um, um, uh, the people from the Department of uh, Transportation, um, you know, looking at some uh, wonderful ideas, especially what you're talking about, uh, Laura. We, we are really uh, looking at um, uh, some sliver of land uh, where we could uh, probably um, uh, have the uh, Department of Transportation to give back to the city and that uh, the city could um, uh, use as um, maintaining the heritage uh, in that area and uh, and and also um, um, uh, uh, building houses uh, in that area. So we look, we're, we're actually working with them right now on that. Great, I'm hoping it's more than a sliver of land. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it will be, it will be more. And the Washington Department of Transportation was, um, uh, a very um, integral stakeholder in the conversations they came to, I think every meeting. Um, and I know that, um, you know, they have their, their own process that they're, they're gonna be running and are doing um, a lot of focus on their placemaking. Um, so we wrapped some of those ideas into the community strategy and certainly hope that that conversation continues forward. And I would just add, if you need any help convincing them, I would be glad to volunteer. Yeah, we you know one of the things that we were thinking about uh, also is um, you know uh, using that land for um, the possibility of uh, student housing. Uh, you know, uh, to uh, pretty much um, um, partner with uh, Gonzaga, uh, uh, Whitworth, uh, uh, whatever. Um, uh, you know, the community colleges uh, where we could uh, provide some um, student housing. So that's that's a, that's another thing that we're, we're looking at. Uh, this is Todd. I, I see Shar is on and she raised her hand. So we would love to invite her to oh, comment. Hello, everyone. Shar K. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful that you all um, have allowed us to participate in the process to date. Um, we um, have been participating, and there's really no need to pressure WashDOT uh, in looking at the available land and availing it uh, for infill development. We've been working for about a year with HUD and Department of Commerce, uh, looking at potential uh, development opportunities with developers, and now we're in the process of looking at a proposal process uh, in which uh, developers would be invited as the land becomes available or identified as available uh, for development. Many of you are aware that recently uh, during the last session of the WSU Senior Architectural Program that um, the w WSU architectural students provided concepts um, of potential development in and around the area for community members to um, just consider, and a couple of community members in city planning uh, also participated in uh, the sessions, uh, the student sessions, where they provided a lot of insight um, on possibilities. And that information ultimately will be provided on our nscplace.com story map uh, quasi webpage um, just to start that conversation as we enter into place in and around the NSC and, and uh, East Central in the next few months. Thank you, Shar. Uh, Tom from the commission, do you have a comment? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, um, I looked over this uh, plan last night. I've, I've uh, council member with us in a time or two 
about this book revitalization program is very exciting. Um, um, I, I love all the ideas that have been expressed. I, I'd like to point something out, if I may, though. What I don't see is opportunity for cultural expression, um, art, theater, opportunities for um, for the present and for the future uh, to express themselves, uh, whereas historical preservation is extremely important. And um, I would just like to express my only, I don't know, concern. I don't know if that, that might be too, too, uh, too much of a word, but just something that I'd like to see uh, implemented or, or included in there somewhere. And as a, as a theater person, I am really pushing the idea of a community theater in that area. Well, Tom, that is that, that is so. Uh, I join you in that, um, and and I'm sh I'm sure that uh, as we um, uh, reassemble uh, this uh, stakeholders group, uh, we would definitely um, uh, consider that uh, because that is something so so valuable uh, for our city. And so I'm hoping that uh, we would be able to uh, go down that road uh, uh, in our uh, future plans. Keep me updated on that. I'd like to uh, help out or, or take part in any way I could as far as that's concerned. Thank you. Mr. President, this is Carol. Yes, please, Carol. Thank you. Thank you, Marn, for a great presentation. I wanted to make a comment on the, um, the Fifth Avenue history that was presented uh, about the league in the 1980s where they helped to establish the uh, East Central Community Center with the city. They were the spearheads on that. Mm -hmm. So, but there's one other piece of information I think that is also missed is that they also started a, a Southeast Daycare Center um, and they were licensed in, uh, they became a nonprofit in 1969. And eventually after the, after the East Center was built, they raised money and built a daycare just on the same campus. And uh, the attorney at that time that they were counsel that was counseling them suggested that they donate that building to the city. So that building has been on the property since 1980 and is probably well over one to two million dollars now. So that's a great asset. And uh, I'd like for them to be, if possible, mentioned under the history. They are probably one of the oldest. Uh, neighborhood daycares licensed for 95 children for very, very low income to moderate income, 95 children. They're probably one of the oldest in the state. So I, I don't want us to forget that piece of history as well. And um, we do lease that building now from the city. We have a 50 year lease on that, uh, which is renewable in another 50 years or uh, after this 50 years is over. So. Um, I just encourage you to find a place on your 5th Avenue history to include that, particularly since the uh, Martin, Luther King, Martin Luther Center is there on the same property. And they also, uh, many people know that they um, have the um, program that takes care of early childhood and Head Start as well. Yes, thank you. We definitely can. Thank you. Ms. Carroll. Ms. Carroll. Yes, Carol, Ronnie. Hey, this, this Pastor Mitchell, amen. Yes, I um, see. You. Thank you. Hey, you know what? Um, and you have you have that his, history, uh, and um, and I'm going to I'm going to be looking forward to you uh, to uh, to join us because we don't want to lose that history. Um, I, I know some of the people out of our out of uh, Bethel Amy Church. Uh, uh, was 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 back there doing that that type of work, and um, would love to have you a part of that because we we need that history. Right, right. I will be rejoining. I did step back for a while, had other obligations, but I will be rejoining the uh, Fifth Avenue um, Community Strategy Assistance. Thank so you. Thank so you very much. much for the work that you've been continuing to do. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We look forward to. Uh, partnering with you uh, on that history because we need it. Great. Thank you so much. Okay. 
Well, Marin, uh, thank you. We're starting to drift on time, but I, I, I also want to thank you. Please come back soon, Reverend Mitchell. I want to reiterate how much I value um, engaging in the House Action Plan when we broke off in stakeholder groups discussing oh, yeah. Yeah. densification without displacement, gentrification, and so forth. Um, you know, I, one thing I would I'd love to see uh, from the city level and maybe from Washdot is is then some additional support to for long range planning. Um, both within the, the 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 subject area, but also the you know extension externalities around it, and specifically, um, you know, I'll point to I, I'm from from Minnesota. I went to the University of Minnesota, and, and Central has always reminded me a lot of an effort, a, a long time effort in in St. Paul from the Rondo neighborhood, and it was it was a strong engagement from the university along with the city, and and a couple out, and it is very similar in the sense that. It was heavily, you know, um, in, impacted by the by the by I ninety in that case, you know, um, affecting the the neighborhood, and a lot of the efforts that have come out of that now are at the infrastructure level, long term planning on, you know, of course, lids, and I know our community have had that kind of discussion before about what, what type of you know twenty fifty year planning should we have in this area for, for you know repairing, you know. Both the neighborhood, Liberty Park, so forth, and and then maybe more specifically, putting actual projects and numbers on the you know intergenerational wealth that was lost on on you know you know and, and on the infrastructure level, so that that we can actually put you know put that on the table when when bigger decisions are being made, and then the last thing I would put out there is. Um, you know, that led St. Paul to, to actually form a reparation committee, and this was one of their primary goals and focuses on uh, discussing that, um, you know, that that neighborhood. So I really think there's some a good model out there to to, to look at if we already already aren't. And then um, last piece, I'm, I'm sorry, but as we discuss potential development or um, you know redevelopment in the neighborhood. To really focus on the environmental justice of, and I know that's part of the discussion. It always is, and you know, in, in with Washdot, but real consideration of environmental justice in this in this area due to the freeway. Yeah, thank you. Great. And just one final thing that we will be back next next plan commission meeting for the public hearing um, to consider the draft strategy prior to going to city council. So. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, we are behind, but we're going to move into um, the six-year street program, and I see Kevin on the call, so we'll hand it over to you. Yes, good afternoon. Um, sharing my screen now. Hopefully that's coming up. Are you seeing my PowerPoint? Just want to confirm. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kevin Picanso from Integrated Capital Management. I'm here today to talk about our six year comprehensive street program update for 2022. And this is just a high clip uh, kickoff. I did kick off um, the program as well before the PCTS last week. Uh, for, for several commissioners that are on the PCTS, this information will be uh, very similar, though I do have a little bit of new information to share. A little bit later here. Um, so first, just kind of context or our background. Um, our six-year street uh, capital program, and specifically in my case, the transportation part, it is really our mechanism to implement the transportation elements and goals and objectives of the comprehensive plan. Uh, once specific capital projects are included in our six-year plan, we can further develop um, the scope schedule budget for those projects, uh, identify funding sources, and then uh, from there the projects can move on to the design and implementation and construction. And we're mandated by the state to update our six-year street program annually uh, prior to July 1st of each year, and then that updated program uh, takes effect the following January. So just uh, jumping into um, overview of changes that will be um, included this year in the plan. First, the projects that are completed and will be coming out. I won't go one by one down all these projects, but 
This is a list of projects that are either completed uh, in construction in 2020 or started in 2020 and are carrying over into uh, this spring of 2021, but we anticipate that they'll be fully complete in 21 and therefore not need to be included um, in the 2022 version of, of the program. And then there'll be a, a few projects that we're tentatively planning just to remove um, from the six year program. There's a, a variety of you know, uh, kind of background on each of these. In some cases, the post street project is somewhat superseded or handled by the ongoing bridge construction that's going on as we speak, as well as some of that scope is uh, can be absorbed or included in the Spokane Falls Boulevard uh, rebuild project that is currently in the plan as well. Uh, North Course Trail study, uh, just the viability of um, of that work and. Um, and it's been somewhat also superseded by some development plans along the North Bank. And so we don't see the need for that study and we'll be pulling it out of the program. And then lastly, the South University Gateway East-West Linkage. We had two projects related to this in our program. The first was a planning study that was completed uh, this past year. This item here was the implementation portion in terms of design and construction. It was, uh, the genesis of it was really uh, Come from the state level in terms of a, a earmark that was being talked about to, to fund improvements through here. Um, that ended up not occurring. And then the outcome of that study, there were a variety of alignments uh, looked at for a bike pad trail. And um, there are some viable options, but they are challenging and they are costly. Um, so at this time, you know, we're, we're pulling this project out of our six year program. It doesn't mean it won't be revisited or, or brought forward in the future, um, potentially. And then moving into some new projects for this year. This is an overview of some of them. I'll go into a little more detail here in a second. There's a project up on Strong Road. There's some uh, locations along Division Street, uh, Boone Avenue, and 44th Avenue. So getting into those specifically, first the Division Street, and I want to kind of use this as a highlight of how um, how some bike and ped projects end up entering our program. We applied for a highway safety improvement grant last year. Um, in the course of doing that, we went before council, um, notifying them of locations we have we have identified through accident data that would be uh, good candidates for safety improvements. We applied for the grants in March. Uh, we're notified that we were awarded one of our projects that we applied for in December of 2020. That project being the Division Street Pedestrian Hybrid Beacons. Um, another term you hear used that people are familiar with maybe are Hawk signals. So there's three different locations uh, where we be installing the hybrid beacons. Uh, the cost is estimated about 1.7 million. Construction tentatively uh, planned for 2023. You'll see the note there at the bottom. We do have some additional grants that are pending as we speak. Um, some safe routes to school grants as well as a bike pad safety grant. Um, we had several locations that have been shortlisted and um, recommended at the staff level for funding, but there's several um, steps that still have to be taken and final decisions haven't been made and ultimately goes before the state legislature. We don't anticipate that we're gonna uh, get the final word on that um, in time this spring to add those projects uh, to our program in this year's update. So uh, most likely this time next year, we'll be talking about uh, adding those projects um, to our program. And then this list, this is the other three projects that as of now were being uh, considered for addition to the program. Those of you who were on planning commission last year, recall that um, the council provided a list of it was nine projects that they requested be added to the program. It came very uh, fairly late in our in our budget process and PCTS and Planning Commission. We didn't have a full opportunity to really look at or vet those projects. Um, from the administration level, we recommended that we consider those projects through this update. Um, so that's what we're planning on doing this year. You'll note that it, I only have three projects listed in their list was uh, from the council was approximately nine projects. The reason the other six projects aren't listed is they were um, street maintenance projects in nature. So they really fall outside of our six year capital program. And those other six maintenance type projects can be considered uh, through the street department's um, six year street maintenance 
uh, occurring that they, that they uh, manage. So again, three projects, I kind of noted them on the map uh, previously is a small project on 44th Avenue um, that's a planned or future arterial, so some paving on that. Um, a consideration of a strong road uh, project by mile to Austin, as well as uh, protected bike lanes on Boone Avenue, uh, Howard to Ruby. And then um, kind of some new information uh, since I kicked this off with the PCTS last week. I think the last week I did mention we were, we were trying to get some study sessions scheduled. That has occurred uh, here in the last week. So they're planned as of now for February 18th and March 4th. Um, they do have packed or full agendas. Um, so our, our time is a little bit limited and kind of split into these two dates. Um, the focus, uh, I, I expect that most of the focus will be on the, the street capital and rebuild matrix elements of our program. And in looking at, um, you know, focus on looking at those out year projects that aren't yet funded. So we're talking projects programmed for, say, 2024 to 2026, that range that don't have a full funding identified, don't have grant dollars secured yet for them. Taking a second look at those projects, as well as looking at projects that are on our list of projects from the rebuild matrix that are, in general, you know, higher scoring and are on that list, but have not yet been added to our six-year program. And looking at those combined with those out-year projects and maybe some reconsideration of some of those priorities. So you may see one or two projects in the very far out years that are currently in the program maybe drop out of the program and maybe a couple of new uh, projects added as part of these discussions. And then finally, um, there's a desire to work with the PCTS to really do a, an overview or a brief a review of the matrix. Uh, scoring matrix. There's a lot of great work done uh, several years ago between the PCTS and Planning Commission and staff to develop that matrix. We don't envision a, you know, wholesale uh, changes to that program or, or redoing that. But I just want to take a fresh look and see if there are any areas uh, within that matrix and scoring process that we want to you know, revise or update. Um, there's, there's numerous criteria and sort of scoring uh, categories, if you will, that go into that process. So we just want to uh, Take a little bit of a look at that and see if there's um, need for some tweaks or changes. Here. And then in terms of next steps, um, again, uh, some study sessions planned with the city council, uh, two workshops with the PCTS in March and April. We come back before the plan commission in April uh, with a consistency review workshop and then ultimately a hearing before the planning commission in May. And that leads to a city council consideration and um, approval of the program, adoption of the program in June in advance of that July 1st deadline um, previously mentioned. I tried to be as quick as I could. I know we're tight on time today, but I can open up for any, any questions if you like. Well, then, Kevin, you, you did catch us up. Hey, uh, any questions for Kevin? <laughs> Kevin, if I could ask a question, this is Tom Sanderson. Yes. Um, it has to do with you, uh, the revisiting of the matrix. Um, are there any particular variables that are in mind right now or being considered to be added and or subtracted from that matrix? And is there any particular reason why? You know, Tom, nothing specific, you know, at this time, um, just with our talks, you know, the last week with council, I, I suspect, you know, maybe some things will come up in that study session, you know, because we will discuss the matrix and maybe kind of remind folks of kind of how it works in different categories um, in those study sessions. We'll see what the outcome is of, of that discussion. You know, there might be, um, you know, some thoughts or recommendations in those discussions you know, to reconsider a couple items. Again, I, from our view, from the staff level, um, you know, we're, we aren't necessarily um, proposing or, or recommending any specific changes at this time. So, um, again, we've got to see what this, how the study session plays out with council, but I don't, again, I don't expect wholesale changes whatsoever. Um, I, I would expect them to be, be minor tweaks in nature. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. 
Anyone else? Okay. Well, hearing none. Um, well, thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Okay. Now we will move back to, uh, to Marn, please, for the Housing Action Plan update. Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Okay. Hello again. I am going to share my screen, reorient myself. Um, all right, so um, back again, I am talk to you more about housing and share an update of our housing action plan process. And as we kind of talked about earlier, this is um, the first workshop in a series that we will be going through with both the plan commission and the city council um to go over draft strategy draft priorities and potential strategies so today i'm going to go uh, do a higher high level overview and then hopefully we can discuss the first priority today i know there was also some things that came up um, on your work plan that might feed into that as well so as a reminder the goal of the housing action plan is to identify strategies and actions to promote greater housing diversity affordability and access to opportunity for residents of all incomes and we've seen increasing affordability and supply challenges, particularly over the last year with the pandemic. So this is a very timely and urgent discussion. I want to quickly touch on the connection between the housing action plan and the comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plan sets the long-term vision for the city and the housing action plan helps inform our housing land use and other policies or other goals and outlined in the comprehensive plan, and then it helps guides implementation of those policies by identifying strategies to further encourage housing development and to help us uh, better meet our housing goals and policies. So I wanna note that the housing action plan does not enact changes directly to the comprehensive plan, but it does help focus, uh, focus the direction, build conversations and enact accountability for change. And so each strategy that would like come out of the housing action plan will have additional public discussion as it is implemented over time. So much like the housing action plan, the housing vision in the comprehensive plan call also calls for affordable housing of all types that is safe, clean, and healthy. And we have two goals in the um, housing chapter of the comprehensive plan. So I just wanted to reference them, one on housing choice and diversity and one on housing quality and preservation. And um, again, the, the housing action plan can help us further meet these goals and be more responsive to our housing needs. Um, also the housing chapter recognizes that neighborhoods change over time and adapt. And so that's important as we talk about how to meet our growing housing affordability challenges that we are facing. So we've been sharing updates throughout the process, uh, including on housing. Um, can you guys still see my screen? Okay. Uh, including on housing needs. Um, let's see what happened here. Can you guys still see my screen? Yes. Can you still hear me? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, resume slideshow. I don't know, something happened and like everything was exited out for me. But you can still see things, so sorry. Um, okay. Anyways, um, so we are beginning discussions around strategies and policy solutions. And we, as I mentioned, we're going to have a series of workshops with both the council and the commission. And we'll continue to work with our working group uh, and identify opportunities for more public discussion. And we ultimately will bring the full plan back, the full draft plan back to the commission um, this spring and then onwards to hopefully adoption by city council. All right, so um, let's see. As I shared, we're going to talk a little bit more about priorities and the potential strategies, starting with the first priority. 
and we will be back uh, throughout February to touch on more of them. Um, okay, something's not lining up, but I'm just going to go with it. <laughs> um, I shared these strategies or these priorities previously, and we've continued to refine them into currently four priorities. Um, and so I just wanted to pause really quick and to see if there was um, any thoughts or comments on how these might reflect your priorities at a high level, knowing that we're going to get into more discussion on strategies, but just wanted to see if there is any thoughts at this level. Okay. Seeing no one, I will continue. I'll just say that I think it reflects. I was like, can anyone hear me? So that, that you don't think that you're all alone here. So, <laughs> okay, I, I can keep going. I just I can't. No, no one's video is on. So, I I have a question, uh, Mr. President. This is Carol. Hello. Go ahead, Carol. Thank you. Um, one question I have, um, Lauren, can you tell me, um, I know that it's been mentioned before, but I can't remember. Do we know uh, approximately how many houses, I know we have a shortage uh, according to the, um, how many houses do we have available now on the market and typically um, X amount. And then my other question is, do we know how many uh, houses we would need for 2021, 2022 to accommodate for our uh, residents here in Spokane? Um, I only caught a little bit of that. Uh, apologies. Um, but I, um, you know, the, the tracking the housing market on the, you know, day to day or monthly basis is certainly done by the realtors. Um, I did just read a newspaper article today that said it's the lowest on record as far as supply. Um, I can answer that. Okay. We have, two, we have 247 <laughs> homes listed as of yesterday morning. We typically this time of year would have about 1500. We have 10 days supply. Normally we consider six months. Uh, inventory, a balanced market, so you can see how out of whack our market is. So, um, my question is, um, I guess, what, um, these for people that are already here in Spokane, or these for the homeless, or these are just people wanting to move up? These are for these are these are total homes for sale to anybody in Spokane at any price. This is our entire market. I guess I'm still not asking that question very well. I, I would like to know how many um, people we have in Spokane that are without housing. Do we have a number on that? I know that we do a count once a year for the, a homeless count. Um, does that help us to identify how many uh, as another substitute or another opportunity to identify how many housing, how much housing we need? Or is it just based it's, on think... realtors? listing of 247 versus 1500. I think um, Maren can send you a link to our housing and action plan page that has quite a bit of information on the general housing market within the region, Carol. So right after her presentation, we'll have her send you to that page and a couple okay. downloads there. Great. Carol I, so Carol, I just got an update. We have 167 homes as of this morning for sale in the entire Spokane market. Oh, oh, thank you, Michael. Should I continue? Or any other question? <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So, um, 
just really quickly as we're starting to talk about terminology with priorities, strategies, da 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 da. da um, I just wanted to give a brief overview of the a draft organization of the plan and how things are nested. Uh, this isn't a full outline, but just how some of these things might be nested and related to each other. So we have the priorities, which you saw on the last page on the last um, screen. That was those are the overarching themes. Each priority has a number of strategies, which is what we're going to talk about today for the first one. And those are identified through pre previous initiatives, housing needs and data, commerce guidance, policy review, engagement. Um, and then each strategy will have a narrative and suggested actions. So um, the full plan will have a lot more detail. We're not quite there yet. Uh, so we're, we're sort of living at the priority level and then exploring some of the strategies um, today. And then as we talk about um, the uh, consideration for different strategies and how we might uh, categorize them, there's a lot of different ways that we can do that. And um, so these are just a few of them. And today we'll kind of touch on how things might, uh, like policy action, what might be required uh, to carry out the, the strategies, level of impact on housing units, a geographic scope timeline, as well as things like addressing past inequities or minimizing these displacements. So there's a lot of different ways that we can categorize the, uh, the strategies or kind of look at how they measure up to a number of different considerations. And so these are just some um, that we are working on. And um, again, there'll be more detail as we build out the actual plan. Okay, so for the first one, um, increase housing supply and expand housing options to create more homes for more people. Um, from our data analysis, we know that the Spokane's housing um, is predominantly single family detached and also an older housing stock. And um, our data shows that housing development fluctuates over time, of course, which is normal and natural. And, you know, we see a lot of development um, sort of you know, pre pre 1940, um, it's fluctuated over time, had some, a lot of development in the nineties, and we are seeing a growing diversity in housing options in the last couple of decades in particular. I know it's kind of small, these images can be seen more in our draft housing needs assessment. Um, and so we also see changes in household size and we know that not everyone needs the same type of house. So we, when we, I've showed this before, but again, we can look at household incomes and what someone can afford and what is what types of housing is affordable. And we can ask, are we reaching a, uh, the broad spectrum of households with our housing options? Um, some other households like with extremely low incomes or those on disability or fixed incomes may not even be reflected on this graphic. And so if we're looking at more homes for more people, how can we further encourage that uh, with some of these strategies? So this is the, the first priority. We identified seven strategies to increase housing supply and expand housing options. And again, we've um, began looking at the policy action required impact on reaching housing needs, the anticipated scope of the strategy and timeline. And we will have a full write up in the plan as I shared. Uh, we're keeping these kind of brief for where we are right now. So I can stop here for a moment um, and there's a lot of information. I sent it at the end of the day yesterday, look over. So you may have had a chance to click through it. I do have some examples of some of these strategies as sort of a visual representation or, you know, to kind of help with the conversation. So I can quickly click through those as well and come back to the list. Or if we want to ask questions or have discussion, um, I can pause here too. Mary, this is Greg. So, what was uh, um, how was impact determined? Good question. <laughs> so, um, right now we are um, we've been talking a lot about that, and that's been something that um, council's also been really interested in. And um, right now, I'd say it's more sort of descriptive or um, qualitative than quantitative at this point, but essentially a higher impact to you know, reach our housing needs, to reach our housing goals versus what would maybe be a lower impact to reach housing needs and goals. 
this is again a high level conversation. And so we're sort of starting to figure, starting to identify that. We don't have like a particular number identified at this point, like if it's over a thousand or less than a thousand, but it's more like what is going to move us farther along in, in reaching our housing needs. And so some of these that are high, maybe we already have, um, you know, we already have infrastructure, we already have investment, um, you know, changes that we've heard from stakeholders could really make an impact in um, the housing supply or housing development. Um, whereas maybe some of the lower ones might just, you know, anticipated not to have like a huge measurable impact. Um, there's still an impact, but um, maybe not as as large as some of the others. So still kind of squishy, but that's kind of what we're working on and certainly welcome feedback. I guess one question I have or comment, I guess, is high and low. <clears throat> I mean, that that to me identifies a very broad gap. And I don't know if that, you know, if because there is no medium, correct? I am. There could be. <laughs> there could be. I, I, yeah, I just don't know. So, yeah. It just makes it easy to feel like, well, we just drop the lows because they're not going to have a high impact. So, hey, oh, sorry to interrupt. Okay. Go ahead, Todd. So I was going to say thank you for all this, by the way. That, this is a, We were talking a little bit about this diagram earlier, but um, so on this diagram, when you say timeline, and I realize it's it's qualitative still at this point, but is is that timeline audience what it would take for the city and stakeholders to implement this, or is it timeline for impact, I guess, right? So if we did one of these things, would we start building tomorrow on something? I guess that's more of the question, right? And I think it's the former, right? Yeah, and it is kind of a composite, again, of, um, you know, what, what is determined to be a priority at the city can very well mean something moves quicker. Um, and so it's sort of reflective of, like you said, the impact um, or potentially the process that it would take to get it through. Um, so, you know, we've been playing around with something like within, you know, something that could be done within two years or something that could be done in a little bit longer. Some of these might require comp plan change, which is, you know, on a timeline and might be a little bit longer. Um, so we were kind of, again, playing around with how that might look and um, just kind of giving a feel to uh, where things are. Um, well, so I would I would state to you, Miranda, we don't have two years time to wait. Right. We need to do something now. We need to have some kind of an impact now. Yeah, so within a certain amount of time, it doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be, we have to wait, but. Yeah, I, I think maybe I'm supporting what, I, I think everyone is aware of that, but I'd like to see, even if it's a heavy lift, you know, if there's a will, can we get it done, right? Because, and, and, and if there's, you know, if, if there's, so let, let me relate this to, you know, the way we approach building codes, you know, state building code council. Yes, the cycles are long and they're big, heavy lifts, right? But we can also go into emergency rulemaking and fill that gap, you know, and and and, and de-risk it for the community. And, and obviously, and we're talking about life safety issues here, right? So we might, but, but we, we take pilot programs and so forth and move them forward and then go into more permanent rulemaking. And I'm, I'm wondering if there's an opportunity here for you know, we speak about these pilot programs and, and look at cities like Tacoma that are looking at all these different implementation opportunities of cottage housing, small lot sizes, infill, so forth, and say, you know, in their case, they allow six of these applic you know, applications per their five districts for each one of those categories. And then they stop and pause when they hit six to have a community, you know, discussion about what's working, what's not you know, rolling into then the long term. So when I look at the 1.4, that might be the thing that has the biggest impact. And yes, it's going to be, a, you know, probably the next periodic cycle, but can we do something in this year on a pilot program that takes a step towards us and gives us some metrics so when we get to the to the periodic update, we have information. Uh, 
I think yeah, and I, the focus today should be on the draft strategy numbers themselves. So we probably could ignore the stuff on the right hand side and let's talk about the draft strategies themselves today too. Sure. I could click through some of, uh, I don't have examples for all of them, but just a few that I pulled um, that might help. Um, and now then we can come back to that table. Um, so, sorry, I don't know. I don't know what this is, but I'm scared to press X on it. <laughs> um, so the, the first one, leveraging infrastructure and investments in centers and corridors, downtown core and target investment areas. Um, the centers and corridors is a key focus of our comprehensive plan on focused growth. And so, you know, we have capacity to, um, to build there now. And so how can we leverage that and um, help, help encourage the growth we wanna see there? Um, similarly with the downtown and some of the target investment areas, these are just a couple examples. We have a lot more around the city. Um, accessory dwelling unit standards. We know that there's a, a lot of talk with the commission and city council on ADUs. Um, so we're just, there's a lot of different options and ways to um, help encourage uh, more development of ADUs. And so we're highlighting this as a strategy uh, one way to achieve housing options, um, also knowing that you know there probably is more of an immediate um, discussion that's going on as well. Um, this is a preliminary drawing that the, we've been working on internally with some of our city staff to help kind of um, make some of the ADU information more accessible. Uh, for 1.4, exploring the housing types and density allowed in zoning districts, again, a key component of the housing action plan is looking at housing diversity, affordability, um, housing options. That's also a key focus in our housing uh, chapter of the comprehensive plan. And so, um, you know, where, where can we explore different housing types and density allowed, um, including not limited to just the single family areas, but what does that look like? This is a table of our current housing options um, with current zoning and so kind of looking back at this and, and seeing where we could uh, help expand options if that is a priority. Um, again, the missing middle housing conversation, these housing types, um, our draft needs assessment shows that only 9% of the housing in the city is attached single family, another 20% is apartments and condos. A lot of these pictures are from Spokane, not all of them, but um, a reminder that we do have them occurring already in our community and, you know, we can encourage more of this. Which helps with affordability as well. And then 1.6 provides strategic utility and transportation improvements. So we've seen a lot of these improvements in some of our key focus areas around the U district, North Monroe corridor, East Sprague, downtown core. Um, we have tangible examples of when we um, use strategic utility and transportation improvements that it can relate to um, more development and potentially more housing. So those are just a few examples. Um, again, there will be kind of unpacking more of this as we move towards a draft strategy or the draft plan, um, but just wanted to provide some of those in case they're helpful in the conversation. So is there anything um, on this list that sticks, jumps out to you as a potential, you know, high focus? Um, is there, you know, something that is missing that you think could be fit in here? Uh, we had some conversations around ADUs, you know, we included that as one way to increase housing options and increase housing supply. Um, Marin, yes. Um, the number one point one leverage infrastructure and investment in centers and corridors, downtown core, target investment areas. I don't know if you were um, on staff when the council approved uh, essentially grants for people who owned commercial buildings to get up to forty thousand dollars to improve the the um, sewer water. Um, upgrade those so that they can develop could redevelop those buildings. And those are the kinds of things I think we should be think that there's that's what I was talking about with low hanging fruit. 
those are the kinds of things that we should be looking at that that we could do that would make or break a project because when you think about forty thousand dollars doesn't sound like a lot, but it could be a tipping point for an investor who has just so much money and if they go over that, they can't complete the project. It was very successful. I'd like to see us do some other things like that. I'd also like to, us to look at the downtown core with 30% of it as surface parking and how can we increase the density down there and, and create more housing? Because when you revitalize a downtown core and make it a 24 seven environment, you lessen the impact of, of adverse behaviors. So I, I would like to do things like that, that council can participate and create something immediate so that we can see more, more housing going in. Great, thank you. Lori, I've got a number that the Association of Realtors gave me, and we have approximately 10,000 homes that we are short at this time. Um, we have a housing summit coming up, and I'll pass that on to yourself and the other members of the commission. Thanks, Michael. If I may uh, speak to something, this is Tom. Uh, one one lesson I think we learned from our last um, uh, um, uh, amendment proposals was uh, we're we're seriously lacking in our transportation infrastructure, especially here on the South Hill. Um, so the one point six that is listed there, I, I think, is something that really needs to really needs to be addressed before we can go forward with certain spots up here on South Hill that could really be developed or looked at for possible development. Thank you. Can you go to the slide that shows um, building types in zones? So, you know, this gives the illusion that so many things are available in so many locations. And I mean, I guess when you look at RSF being what 70% or 75% of our, our land, I'm um, that cuts a couple of things out, but I think one of the components that goes along with this, and, and this goes, I think, back to some of the goals is, while some of these things may be allowed within specific zones, are they practical within those zones because of other constraints, whether it's setback constraints or FAR, or there, there's so many components that go into determining uh, what can be built on a particular parcel. and. I'm not sure if that ends up being captured. Um, I think it is under one of the goals or the priorities is to look at those development standards. But it, that's just a, I guess, a comment that I have. And another piece is some of the missing middle types may not even be included in here. You you include them on the next slide because we'll show fourplexes and triplexes. I don't know if they're included within this matrix. Yeah, this Security is a, this is um, probably, it could be updated as well. Um, yeah, it just stops at the duplex. Um, I don't know. Well, well this is this is Terrell. Um, the right now that would be in multi-family uh, residential in that column because we don't call out triplexes as a, a type, for example, in the zoning code. But we do call out duplexes. So could we could be an amendment to the zoning code? 
could we potentially split that multifamily residential into small scale multifamily residential and large scale multifamily residential? I, mean, I think that the answers would be the same, but I think when you point out that small scale multifamily would not go into RSF or RTF, I think that's a statement that is worth thinking about. Those are certainly codeman ideas. So, but maybe if we can memorize this chart and then if we go back to the to the um, the list of of objectives, please. You know, I think one of the, thank you. One of the cross cutting pieces here that I, I I've always thought is is missing is to um, like you know we've talked about this before, like the Hollis study a few years ago in two thousand six, where they did a, a study on actual. Um, from a developer's perspective, the different housing types, and then be able to map that across our, our city where we have across you know, realized density, across lot size, across AMI, most importantly, right? And then our new displacement map. If we start to look at all those together, we can start to pinpoint what the, the potential is across these different housing types. And then we know where developers will start to hit their cap rates and so forth and want to do that. At the same time, being careful about displacement now that we are layering that into our, our discussion. So, um, without any specific strategy here, I would, I would think that would be very, really valuable not to make it a long term study, but to be able to answer questions like Michael asked, you know, where are the. Where are the immediate opportunities and where are the longer term? You know, I, I agree with all of these center and corridors and downtown and so forth, but those are longer term high risk projects that we may miss this immediate cycle, but there's a lot of lower, smaller projects that are not at the at the urban growth boundary, you know, periphery, right? I'll, I'll restate that. They're not the suburban models, they're the infill models that that will have a, will have different opportunities of cap rates, but it's, it's a different type of construction than single family housing. Uh, can I say something? I, it, so, if you're looking from a standpoint of um, something that's quicker than something else, I mean, a code amendment is quicker than a comprehensive plan amendment. <laughs> those more often and, you know you are in this structure of you have a, a comprehensive plan you have a zoning code you have these rules and regulations that you're dealing with at the city and you have to live with those but if you want to amend something quicker and get to the point you're at uh you want to get to todd i think the the best thing to look at to begin with would then be the code making changes to the code so and I think that kind of hits at what you're you're aiming for. And that you know that that former uh, chart that we were looking at that is the zoning code categories, and so you're not going to have those split out. But like Terrell said, you could split those out if you want to revise your code, your code to say those two things. So I think there's a lot of uh, leeway there for if you're going to do something short term, maybe the code would be the way to go first. And I, I, I like all of these, these uh, strategies. I think that they, they hit on everything that you're look, you're talking about looking at. I think they're all well written for one, but I think they uh, make a lot of sense. This is Carol. Hi, Carol. Hi, I have a question for um, our uh, council person. I'm sorry, uh, but. Uh, she was talking about low hanging fruit. I'm wondering if she may have other suggestions. Uh, she mentioned the $40,000 grant. What are some of the other suggestions that she is maybe aware of that can be implemented quickly? Um, 
Hi, Carol. Thanks. Um, just call me. Oh, what's her name? That works. All you time. know, just Lori. I am so sorry. That's okay. I, <laughs> I'm taking you out for ice cream. I do apologize. Um, to the scoop, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, Absolutely. So that's one of the things that just um, hit me right away was that that incentive. But there are others, and I I would have to talk to um, Chris Becker, who's our development services person to see what other things could be incentivized around reactivating um, some of our buildings that are already there. We also have opportunity to build on the what's now surface parking. If you do a parking structure, we can now do um, parking and residential. So how I want to look at, you know, you kind of caught me by surprise because I can only think of that one thing, but I want to look at what else can we do around um, downtown specific. We could probably amend height requirements or do things that would make it easier for a developer to build something if it's higher. So stuff like that. And I'm sorry I don't have more specifics for you, but but they're out there and we just need to explore them. This is Tom. Can I ask a question on that? Uh, what you were just talking about, council member? Sorry, yeah, I can't get my video started. Sorry, Tom. Or I... That's just fine. Mine doesn't work either today. So, um, so I was, I've been thinking about this incentive, uh, incentivizing, uh, and would it be beneficial for the city to consider um, improve, improvements on the infrastructure, basic infrastructure like broadband? Is that the type of incentivizing that you're that you're speaking of? Yeah, and we're we're doing that. So when we open up a road, we can lay fiber down. So then, when it comes time, um, for example, East Sprague, when that road was opened up, fiber was was laid down. So if buildings or if businesses wanted to relocate on East Sprague, they would have um, fiber already there and could easily access it. So yes, those sorts of things. Um, are some are things that I would be talking about. So some of those things we're already doing. And 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 along with that, uh, green building and, and things like that as well. I imagine are being talked about. Um, yeah, and you know the catalyst building again on East Sprague would yes. be. They're using steam, so it is um, a green building, and that's that's going to take a little bit more time. You've got to show that those things were going to pencil out and be productive and cost effective over time. But absolutely. Thank I, you. I see where you're going and yes. Yeah, I was just I was just that's just some personal research I was looking at. Uh, thank you for answering that. Okay, any other comments? I think we're drifting a little bit. My fault. Thank you. Um Ms. Mary? Yeah, go ahead, Mary. Um has any thought been given to how much perhaps excess commercial property we will have post pandemic because of all the shifts in the way businesses are being done? And what will we do with the excess commercial property? And are there, I mean, more than just uh, Northtown, but what could be done there? Because the property is already built. Yeah, great. That's a great one. And that is something that we have at least um, mentioned um, as a potential action that could help further some of these, um, you know, well, and that's something that thing, you know, a funding mechanism, like a, um, you know, the a entity out there buying Somebody um, land or buying buildings now could help. Because I'm I'm pretty convinced that commercial will never quite go back the same again. Because I think lots lots of people are going to be doing stuff from home, and that telecommuting is going to change the landscape on how much office is needed. Yeah, absolutely. 
And um, some of that is also wrapped up into some of into our the next priority um, preserve and protect housing affordability and quality. Um, so, you know, we're trying to capture it in multiple ways throughout. Okay, um, well, thank you. By the way, did um, on neighborhood retail, did anyone else see yesterday that Berrien's trying to steal our thunder on reinstating neighborhood retail? That went out of, anyway, we, we, we need a little more marketing around that. We, we beat them to the, to that game a couple years ago, right? Oh, no, I talking about. Our, ours is limited to existing neighborhood retail. That's what theirs is too. Oh, That's okay. what theirs is too, was being able to bring that back. They fell out of performance, right? Anyway, side thing, but that, anyway, I would love to see more neighborhood retail focus too. And that was one on the list, so. Okay. Okay, before thank you, everyone. We, yep, before we leave housing, Todd, yeah. I would just like to relate a real quick personal note, uh, just to give you some numbers to think about. On the 29th of, of January, a home was listed on West Heroy. They had 72 showings that Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. They quit taking bids on the property Monday afternoon. And needless to say, it went for a great deal more than the 210 they were asking for. But that's 72 families that are out there looking for homes and we don't have anything to accommodate them. That's something else we need to address. Yeah, thank you. I think we uh, need to put this on our schedule every every other week. We can definitely keep going Happy on Happy to come back. <laughs> All right, thank you for everything, Marn. Yeah, thank you. Okay, um, sorry, Jason. So we'll, we'll move into transit area development. I, I see a few names on here. So welcome everyone. Uh, we'll just hand it over to Jason. Okay, if we can, let me see if we're gonna share my screen and I'm gonna see if I can get that going. And that should happen pretty seamlessly here. I will cue that up. So can everyone see a title slide, transit oriented development, uh, TOD fundamentals and best practices? Is that clear to everyone? Looks good. Great. All right. Um, without introduction, I'm just gonna get going. I wanna thank everyone today for your level of endurance, um, a long session today. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to get in front of you to talk about this project. And I think this is perfect timing uh, dovetailing behind um, Marin's housing action plan, because I think of the seven strategy items that she listed, we'll be able to address those, each one of those line item by line item in the work that we're uh, beginning to do here along the city line corridor. So with that intro, we'll, we'll get going with an introduction to this project to you all. And again, thanks for your time this afternoon to listen to this um overview five parts to our the presentation introduction overview we're going to go over the fundamentals really what what is important in station area planning best practices and then how we'll use that information to craft uh transit oriented development framework and regulatory approach for the city line corridor and we'll close obviously with some discussion at the end you may have some questions gather your feedback on what we're proposing to do. So the introduction, the project is, is being led by planning and development services. So Colin Quinn Hurst is your project staff lead. And of course he's managed by Lewis uh, and other staff members supporting him. We've built um, kind of a project management team or oversight team with representatives from um, ICM, uh, Spokane Transit Authority, and, and the Spokane Regional uh, Transportation Council. I think after hearing Marin's presentation, she's a pretty valuable asset that we may want to roll into this. So the oversight group is really going to work with the consultant team to look at deliverables over four phases um, to help give us guidance um, in, in kind of tightening up that information as we then bring it forward to the plan commission and city council over two touch points. So 
again, consultant team led by the Spokaning, uh, Spokane Planning and Development Services touch points with City Council and Plan Commission to review our work. And then we do intend to have a larger uh, public presentation, um, information and, and gather, you know, feedback gathering session near the tail end of our work. So we're not producing a document for adoption, but we're really trying to create a strategy for circulation and land use that's transit supportive around the city line and what regulations then might help guide development along that corridor over time. I'm Jason Graff. I'm the principal of center based planning leading this effort and I'm assisted by Angelo planning group, um, which really thrive on code and policy around mixed use and transit supportive development. So we've got a tight team. We're based in Portland, Oregon, um, but we've got. A level of experience that I think is is ripe for the project that we're we're approaching here in Spokane. And so a little background on my work, downtown revitalization planning is the work I've been doing for 18 years, as well as station area and enhanced transit facilities design. And Lincoln, Nebraska is a project that um, I've worked on since 2005. And it really represents um, in similar fashion Spokane in the mid-tier city. You have roughly similar population, 200 plus thousand people. You have a university that's really central to downtown. Um, and what we found is that trends in urban development is really about placemaking and it's about revitalizing the core. You've all done that, maintaining a retail presence in the downtown, strong convention center network. You're dialed into NCAA tournaments and you know the strength of Gonzaga in that market has has I think helped make Spokane a very robust economy in your sort of inland empire setting. So a lot like you all, Lincoln's kind of in the middle in between everybody else, um, but they're doing just fine. Thank you. Um, and we were able to really to work with the city and their partners, the university, uh, the development. Um, department and tax increment financing to work with local developers to create a mixed use district. And here is the Haymarket. Really, the the centerpiece to that was a new arena, but it's also included a number of hotels, housing, entertainment. It's the dining destination on the west side of downtown Lincoln. And so that project really leveraged twenty two million dollars of tax increment finance to stimulate nearly $140 million of investment. And since from 2012 to 2016, downtown, so this district, the, the core and capital, and then the Eastern side, which is more of their tech industry sector that's teamed with the University of Nebraska Lincoln, we've seen a billion dollars of investment in downtown. So I'm, I'm well adept at what the trends are in urban development and have been working on that for decades now. Um, similarly, Lewis kind of gave us a stroll down Sprague Avenue and we looked at some of the streetscape, streetscape improvements and redevelopment that's occurring along that segment. And I've looked at the planning efforts that you all have done with the South University District. And that reminds me of some work that we did in a smaller town in Oregon of Medford and kind of repurposing what was an older industrial light manufacturing district into a centerpiece for public gathering just on the edge of downtown and what became the local corporate headquarters for Lithium Motors, who were positioned already in Medford, were looking for a suburban location to create their headquarters facility. Um, and the city or renewal district and the firm I was at at the time, we worked together to develop a plan to keep them in downtown. And we were able to leverage about $4 million in creating these public amenities, these park blocks that was then are setting for that corporate headquarters and additional development that's occurring around the edges. And it's really become a saving grace to the downtown. And I, I think much of what you are gonna see in that South University district, um, I've seen models that work and I think you're all moving in the right direction. Along with mixed use and redevelopment downtowns, we're also seeing trends and shifts in walk and bike facilities that are expanding and improving the quality of life. And in Lincoln, they realized 
our our growth we're missing some aspects of our growth and the ability to move around the downtown walking and biking and so a major investment was put in a mile long protected bikeway that connected the tech industry on the east in antelope through the downtown and into the hay market um, which also then connected to a two mile long trail loop that surrounded the entire city so a lot of these aspects of redevelopment I see in Spokane. I've um, been fortunate enough to be a part of these redevelopment projects in other cities. And so I, I help bring that to the table. When we look at code and regulations, we really need to think about how we preserve those strong assets that define communities. So here in Albany, strong historic district, Angelo Planning Group, who is my partner on this project and, and helping you all and us together on this project in Spokane, um, fine tuned their development code to preserve these assets, but also look for opportunities to increase housing options in the downtown that weren't occurring, occurring sort of naturally in the market, um, as well as looking at parking requirements and, and some adjustments to standards to preserve this high quality environment and a strong asset to the city of Albany. And I recently completed the Gold Line Bus Rapid Transit Oriented Development um, circulation plans, development plans, and guidelines around 11 stations. This is a nine mile bus rapid transit route beginning in East St. Paul. So through a, a pretty transit dependent neighborhood on the east side, then running into um, 3M corporate headquarters, which will be on the, align, the alignment and moving easterly in, into the suburbs. So I have um, kind of a unique perspective on a diversity of development types that then extend along that continuous nine mile corridor. And I work with five cities uh, and two counties to adopt plans for those station areas. And so we bring that to the table as a part of this project. I think what's important for all of us to understand is that the transit authority is really creating a tool that's going to leverage the next generation of development. And I think transit is absolutely central to you know, emerging trends and, and who is choosing to live in urban environment, urban environments, but also those people who already live in urban environments, um, maintaining you know, their quality of life and their ability to stay in the neighborhoods that they currently live in. So we're working from, from two polars, but we're going to come together to try to give, I think, the, the best solutions to improve the quality of life for people living in neighborhoods and new people coming on board. So let's get to the point of this project. The study purpose is here. We're, our purpose is to identify an approach for transit supported regulatory changes and priority infrastructure investments, primarily walk bike improvements that can be applied along the high performance transit corridors and implements the comprehensive plan centers and quarters growth strategy. So the Spokane Transit Authority, of course, they're building a six mile BRT line. 28 stations through five districts. Each district has kind of its unique quality and character. And these are things that we will build off of as we look at um, a framework around those station areas. And of course, that's a $92 million investment creating premium transit across the central part of the city, linking the universities, the downtown, key neighborhoods, and of course, the community college. And it's it's a it's a tremendous asset. It's forward thinking. I think it puts Spokane ahead of the curve in terms of urban redevelopment, at least from what I've seen across the country. You know, you're you're really positioning yourselves um, to you know improve the quality of life and to really target and and bring growth in your community around these corridors. And it is the frequency of this service that will be desirable not just for the peak rider who's hopping on the bus to go to work in the morning, but all day service of people moving back and forth um, to grocery stores, to school, to any number of daily needs, goods and services. The BRTs function extremely well because they are along the corridors where development exists. They're not in the middle of a highway. They're not on the edge somewhere. And so it's a tremendous value to have this asset running through 
these neighborhoods and districts in the downtown. So our charge then as a part of this project is working with the city of Spokane to really leverage that investment and in transit along the corridor to look at a framework for station access and transit supportive development around the stations. And so there are some basic fundamentals that we work from as we think about a framework around the station areas and the regulations that then might guide that over time. And there's really four primary principles um, that we work from. And the first is establishing not just a bus rapid transit corridor, but a multimodal corridor. And this is happening across the country where not only we're we investing in transit, but we're investing in the walk and bike facilities that connect station to station. We know we can increase potential ridership by improving access to those transit stops and with new development. Um, and with the leveraging that investment in transit, we can enable station areas to achieve their development potential. We can capture latent markets. We can capture robust markets, for instance, around multifamily housing, looking at opportunities for goods and services close to a station that allow people to to chain trip and to walk to services close by instead of driving out to outlying areas around the community. And overall, improving the quality of life, connecting those stations to destinations within each of the neighborhoods. And then finally, really creating a tool so that the city can prioritize infrastructure investments, improvements to streets um, that allow us to get to transit, that allow us to get to destinations in our neighborhoods, and then those policy changes that allow for transit supportive development to occur. So those are the principles that we work from. There's a geographic area that we apply to any station area. And of course, it starts really in the middle at the station itself and what kind of environment is that like. Um, we then look for opportunities to increase development at the station, more people, potentially more jobs, potentially more goods and services that serve the neighborhood as a focus at the station itself. And then we radiate out about a quarter mile into what we call the station neighborhood and look for opportunities for infill or adding additional housing in that zone. And then in that half mile, it's really important that we have some vital uh, transportation connections to destinations that might be um, just outside of that uh, station location. And so we'll get into what sort of the characteristics of, of all of that looks like. In the end, we're integrating land use and transportation to increase transit ridership and enhance the quality of life in the neighborhoods that the transit is moving through. And we focus on three primary elements. Um, the TOD fundamentals, and they really begin with the station location and its environment. And safety is the priority. So we want to promote activity at the station with well-defined crossings um, so the station stations are accessible. And here's a, a caricature, caricature and an image of some of the characteristics that really define um, a safe and comfortable and inviting station environment. And of course, those safe crossings that connect those people walking and biking, which 80% of your riders are going to be within that quarter mile uh, walk of the station. Can they get across the roadways to the platforms? It's critical that we have crosswalks and good facilities for that. We also want to encourage development that, that we call eyes on the station. So there's activity um, that really promotes a safe environment. It allows for you to drop off close at a, at, a, at a laundry or pick up a cup of coffee in the morning or, or one on the way home. And so there is a variety of different conditions that we want to try and create around the stations. The next is to think about station access and linking the station to destinations in the neighborhood. And it's important that we have direct and continuous link from those stations to neighborhood destinations. And traditional transit-oriented development has been focused on the five-minute walk, but the emerging trends in bike facilities, when they're built in communities, much like you saw the image in Lincoln, we can now capture additional riders within a five-minute bike ride, which extends out a mile. So where we used to look at walking infrastructure within about a quarter mile of the station, we really need to look at some of those key routes that then also action or also funnel in 
cyclists into the station area and add that five minute system, expanding it. And of course, the policies around public works and how we build and construct streets really need to shift the priority toward walking and biking. It's not to preclude auto or essential services, but we really need to think in walk and bike terms when we're looking for key routes that are important to access transit. And so the routes have a number of characteristics. I mentioned the multi-use corridor where we integrate bus rapid transit with walk and bike facilities. And this is an image of the orange line in Los Angeles, Los Angeles, California. Um, and it's really this type of facility more and more cities are incorporating together. Um, so it isn't just transit, but it's the full, full deal. And there's a number of other routes that we need to consider in different ways that we access the stations or we access the station to destinations in the neighborhood. And in a more robust environment where there's opportunities for redevelopment, more transit supportive development where we can create what you might call a destination um, or active transit supportive streets, they might look something like this. And this is a characteristic that creates sort of a hub around a certain type of station that can that can generate this type of development. But quite often we're looking at neighborhood access routes, those low stress streets that get existing residents and neighborhood folks um, a safe direct path to transit stations along the corridor. And your greenways program um, really is, is a tool to promote these neighborhood access routes to the station. So I'm glad to see that you have existing facilities um, in place that we can use as a tool along the station area. And of course, we all know that there is auto dominated streets um, through portions of the corridor where we need to look at some stronger measures to promote safe access either along those corridors or across those corridors to reach transit. And so then the third piece to station area planning revolves around transit supportive land use. Um, where we quite often look for a mix of station and street oriented uses um, at the station stops or within a station area. And that can be a range of development, preserving in some instances existing single family neighborhoods, uh, in other instances, looking at opportunities for larger redevelopment. And in that geographic overlay around the stations, we look a little further out in that quarter mile area, this is called the fried egg diagram and the station neighborhood, that quarter mile area, five minute walk outside of the station itself is where we look for infill development sites to address much what we heard today from the housing action plan folks is addressing that missing middle housing and how can we, where are the opportunities then to insert the duplex townhomes courtyard housing um, into existing neighborhoods to elevate um, some of the ridership potential in those neighborhoods. And at the same time, it's really the transit dependent neighborhoods and housing affordability that you don't wanna lose. So as redevelopment comes on line around the transit line, we have to be cognizant that we're not pushing out the actual folks who are the riders and use the transit system. As we get closer to the station in an ideal station uh, plan, we create what's called a station hub. And we look for vacant and underutilized sites for infill that like might look something like this, that creates uh, and supports an 18 hour environment where you have ground floor retail or dining or services with housing or maybe office above. That doesn't occur at every station, of course, and there's also opportunities where along existing residential streets, there may be opportunities to build on a commercial node. For instance, I think Mission Avenue uh, in particular has some of the characteristics that might be able to support um, additional infill and redevelopment that creates uh, additional uses that can serve the neighborhood and create an active station environment at the same time. While there may be also other opportunities for infill along primarily residential portions of the corridor um, to create that active street oriented street oriented housing um, up to the street. So the station area plan really provides policy 
and implementation guidance for the station area based on assessments of the station area conditions that addresses these three components, station environment, station access, and transit supportive land use. And so in the station area plan, you typically create a vision for that station. What, what is transit or in development intended to be? What level of development intensity and how does that match the character of the station area, support the character of the station area? What are the transit supportive land uses then that we would generally see where opportunities exist over time through vacant underutilized properties? And what's the capacity for that development? We then also look at what are those key station access routes where improvements should occur over time and what level of walk and bike improvements might we expect to see on some of those key routes. And we also need to look at potentially where infrastructure uh, deficiencies occur or how do we guide new development online so that it's meeting um, the needs of our, you know, and don't exceed the capacity of our infrastructure system today. And then finally, an implementation plan really prioritizes decision making and investments around the station area. The second part of the station area plan are the standards and what are those transit supportive uses at any given station area and addressing densities, for instance, dwelling unit per acre. Uh, FAR, which is floor area ratio, how much of building is allowed to be built on a site and getting those to at least a minimum level that we're supporting transit. Um, and also addressing the physical form of those buildings so that they're creating active edges. We're addressing building heights where we transition from lower from, for instance, a single family uh, uses on the periphery of a station area. Uh, we look at parking standards and, of course, the design of some of those key station access routes, so the streets within the station area. These are the components that typically make up a station area plan. Now, for this project, we're going to short form that framework piece, and our study approach will look something like this. The six mile corridor based on staff recommendation will be compressed. You've done a lot of work in terms of district planning and zoning around the downtown and the South University area and the recommendation to keep our scope tight and make sure we can give you a product that is usable. We're going to focus on the Cincinnati segment and then that Mission Avenue segment um, further east to the community college. Our process is four phases. It's going to occur over seven months, so we're going to hit around the tail end of August and be near the end of our work. Um, you're going to you see those two white boxes there. We have two points uh, where we have milestones to review um, the deliverables and work plan elements that we've prepared during those two two points to get feedback from the plan commission and city council after phase two, and then at phase four when we have a draft document. Will come again to the plan commission, the city council, and public, um, and we're kind of developing the details around that last public piece as we move through the process. So the first month and a half, so about mid March, we're going to explore the corridor conditions, and we'll become familiar with its physical details and the policies and plans around these station areas that you see here. So that Cincinnati Mission Corridor, to really look at station environment and access identify the presence and lack of walk bike facilities. Can we get to the station? Are there gaps? Um, where are transit supportive development? Where is it naturally occurring now? Where are the destinations that we need to connect to? And where are gaps? Where are maybe the potential for neighborhood serving goods and use, uses that could occur around a station that aren't there today, but maybe there's an opportunity in the future? And of course, really where gaps can be filled occur on those transitory development opportunity sites. So vacant and underutilized properties along the corridor. And then we'll look at the existing policies that exist along the corridor to see how well they match with uh, the ability for transit supportive uses either now or changes that may be necessary over time. And exploring the conditions are We'll cover these main points. So we'll evaluate the station environment uh, and access, as I mentioned, presence and, and 
and lack of active uses. This is an image of uh, Mission Avenue here on the top where you see some active uses already exist. There's signals that allow for some traffic control that um, improve access to the station, but there's also areas of blank walls, for instance, along Cincinnati and other active uses along Cincinnati. So we need to inventory that to know where potential regulations or uh, improvements over time can uh, increase the viability of those station areas to be more active and promote better access. It's not a condemnation at all of your existing infrastructure. It just lets us know what work we have in front of us to, um, to overcome. And of course, you know, there, there is a number of conditions where there's gaps in the system or there's an inability to cross the street. So as we become familiar with those, we track those, we can then identify a framework for how we might overcome some of these barriers. And of course, expand and improve existing facilities. So the Children of the Sun Trail, for instance, is a big one. The Cincinnati Greenway project, um, well underway, again, informs uh, how we look at other facilities um, along the corridor. So you have some tools in place. Maybe those can be expanded into other areas. So the transit supported development, knowing where that is occurring and where it isn't occurring is important. Um, and are there opportunities to transition, for instance, the single use low density areas into more transit supportive uh, development locations um, and repurpose some of that street oriented development into something that's more street oriented. And destinations are absolutely critical. So the Safeway and the grocery stores, those um, opportunities for dining along the Hamilton corridor, um, anchor uses and traffic generators. We want to we we need to know where they are and how we can best connect uh, them to the station. And I think COVID nineteen has really opened up how parks and open space have played kind of a fundamental. <laughs> lifeline for a lot of us, especially those with kids and the utilization of parks now is just kind of off the charts, certainly locally in Portland. And I'm sure you're seeing the same thing um, in Spokane. And, and so the city line plays a vital role in getting people to those locations. Um, and so it's important that we, they're accessible and, um, and, and used. And then of course, We'll work with the Spokane Transit Authority to identify where high ridership stations are, because as we prioritize investments in street improvements and we look for applying regulations that support transit uh, supportive development, we really want to target areas that improve the ridership um, over time. And so that's a focus for us. I think consistent with the housing action plan where there's opportunities for redevelopment, we need to look at what uses, what, where are the gaps in uses along the corridor, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's a lack of daily needs, goods and services, maybe parks and open space. Um, so we can begin to think about what those land uses might be to fill those gaps and where those might occur in, in places where redevelopment opportunities might exist. And, I've got a tag here on the left hand side because I saw a study from 2015 that mapped across the country what it costs, um, what a housing wage is for a two bedroom apartment. And what I saw for Washington State was you'd spend, you'd earn $21.46 an hour, uh, spending 30% of that income to afford a two bedroom apartment as an average in Washington State. In Oregon, it was 16, and Idaho was 15. And I'm sure Seattle skews the number, but I think it's important that we, there's no doubt that affordable housing is a key aspect of what we need to preserve, um, as well as bring on more housing, because frankly, adding housing to the market is extremely important. Supply is important as well as maintaining affordability. So it's a it's a bit of a heavy lift, but I think it's one word we'd like to embrace and work with you on. So then in our exploration of the quarter, we locate TOD opportunities, as I mentioned, on vacant aging and underutilized properties, parking lots, but also importantly, city and Spokane Transit Authority owned properties because the city owned, the public owned properties sometimes means we have a greater ability to uh, impact the type of development 
that goes onto those properties to incentivize a certain type of development um, and the way it's built and oriented to the street that really, you know, create the environment that we want to see along the corridor. So we can advance some sites potentially that are, are um, publicly owned. We can sometimes do those sooner rather than later. And then, of course, we're going to identify the lack of TOD policies and regulations that exist along the corridor. And some of the things that we look at when we're looking at your existing codes is, you know, what are the minimum FARs? And if they're not greater than 0.5, um, then it's really not transit supportive. And we can also look at dwelling units per acre, for instance, is another indicator on how transit supportive um, uh, the regulations are around the corridor. We look at parking requirements. Of course, mix of uses is one indicator. Density is frankly more important. Um, and then looking at build two lines, what's the physical form of the code to make sure we create active streets. In the second phase, we'll develop and review frameworks and potential regulatory concepts. So what we're going to do is prepare a draft stationary planning framework. So what are the transit supportive uses and opportunities where redevelopment might occur? Where are some, where are the key station access routes um, and what form might those be? And what is a transit oriented development regulatory approach that we can apply around the station areas or potentially along segments of the corridor? And the station area plan framework will consist of these five elements. So we will establish a corridor vision. We're going to define the character of each of those unique districts. We establish what are called station typologies. Each station area is unique and different, and the development around that station um, really needs to meet what certain typologies are. And we identify our hierarchy of station access routes. And then, of course, then we'll look at options um, and a potential approach for regulation around each station unique to those station typologies. And so the vision corridor really addresses these elements, a safe and active station environment, where are the opportunities for transit and type of transit or infill that might occur where long term sites might exist. Um, and then what are those essential station access improvements? We'll look at the character and previous profiles of each of the neighborhoods to really identify their defining characteristics and features, and then what the intent for transit oriented development would be specific to those districts, opportunities for transit oriented development, and what major destinations exist within each of those district areas. And as I mentioned, we then uh, overlay in a uh, station typologies on each of the stations. These is, this is an image of the work that was done in St. Paul, where we had neighborhood stations, which primarily weren't going to change. Um, we had mixed use neighborhoods where there were some opportunities for infill and creating a station hub. We had employment stations, commerce stations. These typologies then inform the type and intensity of TOD. Um, and they respond to specific policies like your senator centers and corridors growth strategy. We'll look at in the station area framework, a hierarchy of access routes. So we're going to address the need for station to station connections as well as station to destinations access. Uh, the idea then is to close gaps. Um, in walk bike routes, potentially propose new ones, certainly address opportunities in the planning for the children of the sun um, and, and potentially others. I know Cincinnati is one um, as well. That It's a model that we may uh, utilize in other parts of the corridor. And then there's a number of regulatory approaches that we might pursue. The first, and that's the third bullet I'll talk about, is do we expand the centers and corridor zones that already exist? And the form-based standards, for instance, that you've created along Hamilton Street as a model for what we might apply to stations, uh, specific nodes along the corridor, or maybe the entire corridor and those parcels abutting uh, the corridor itself. So, or we may use a hybrid or, or some other method. So we're, we're open at this point then to look at what the possibilities are, knowing that you do have some existing mechanisms that we really need to test first. Um, we will then create a draft regulatory approach for a specific focus area on the corridor. So we may look at 
a couple of stations. We may look at parcels fronting the corridor. That's to be determined after our analysis phase, um, but we will get to a more uh, condensed, detailed segment of the corridor for recommendations, which will include basically a regulatory and standards outline. So intent of that regulation, where they would apply, um, the types of standards that we would need to be associated with that regulatory piece. And then how would the regulations be administered? Because uh, I think that's extremely critical in knowing from your current processes, how something new online would then be administered for new development along the corridor. And we'll review those findings, of course, with the plan commission um, and the public that draft document. The draft document then will be finalized and summarized. We'll basically memorialize all phases of the project and incorporate that into an action plan uh, once we've vetted that draft regulatory approach, um, giving those next step recommendations for further staff actions and review that with you all, um, uh, the plan commission and the city council. And so that ends my discussion. I'm gonna hit escape here and the screen then can go back to uh, Lewis and others. I want to thank you for your patience. And Lewis, do you want to kind of kickstart the discussion phase? Yeah, we're really looking for um, first impressions from Plan Commission regarding what you've seen and coming up with this framework that we're going to. What we're trying to do is build an understanding and a toolkit that the community will be able to understand that we're going to be applying elsewhere throughout the city in future years around transit. Um, this could apply along the Division Street corridor, the Division Connect study that's ongoing currently uh, with STA being led by SRTC. This can ap apply to other frequent high performance transit uh, stops and areas uh, such as Monroe Street corridor. This is really the intention of taking it beyond just even our center and corridor planning, but how do we best integrate that with uh, transit and linking, getting people to transit stations and looking at the land use around that infrastructure needed. So, Jason, do you want to stop sharing or yeah, stop sharing and we'll sure. see. We can go back to sharing if needed. Um, but I think it's best if we are in person view, talking head view to the discussion <laughs> yep. purposes. And stop sharing. There we go. Yes. Thank you. Looks like we're losing some people there too, but, uh, but thank you, uh, Jason. You bet. I know that was a heavy lift for you guys. It's been a long day. It was, it was a great way to, and it's yeah, Greg, please. For yeah. Well, one thing I I'll comment on, I, I thought was great was, you know, we've always talked about that quarter mile or five minute walking corridor and and i really do like the idea of the whole bicycle concept and mm -hmm. and utilizing that so that just really broadens our opportunities for public transit so much more so mm -hmm. yeah it makes me feel there's tremendous potential here i mean it's uh it's a really tremendous. And like I said, you all are really ahead of the curve. I mean, quite frankly, you really are. So it's an opportunity you, you don't want to miss. It's, it's really this effort is to once again, pile on the, the city of Spokane came up with the center and corridor framework in the 2001 plan. It took I, about 10 years before our transit agency really uh, took that and ran with it and started linking those centers up and and starting to focus their high performance system, uh, the stay, stay going forward plan from STA. And this is really another layer of coming back. And now how do we once again, relook at land use and association with that transit and the opportunity of providing uh, new housing, uh, new employment along those lines and potentially reducing housing, uh, the whole household cost of living being able to, you know, create housing that I think they call it the green dividend in Portland. I don't know if they're yes, still calling they it do. that. How can you, you know, reduce your transportation costs um, as a part of a household? Maybe you go from two cars to one car, one car to no car, 
and your your life is based more around transit and connecting yourself to the city's uh, city's good. So. Well, uh, thank you. I want to commend everyone, the city, especially for picking this as a subject area. I think this is, I, I think it's an excellent study area. I, I think Cincinnati is interesting. I, I'm glad it's in there, but it's the mission component of it is much, much more interesting, especially with all the single family and then, and then the, and then the adjacency to the, to the industrial. Um, and this is, I have an honest question is a little outside of my area, but one thing I've always observed with transit oriented development is, 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 uh, is the emphasis on the station. And, you know, when we start to show the overlapping circles, it immediately starts to imply some sort of density and activity and so forth, redevelopment around, you know, the line. Um, how, how do you approach it where we can approach this, everything from Trent to the river and, and say, our goal is to make sure that everyone has access within a five minute walk for, you know, food and so forth, right? And one of the, this was identified, you know, about five years ago when we were starting the food policy council as one of the most challenging food desert areas. And how do we make it so that it's not a focus on Safeway and people walking with plastic bags, you know, from the transit stop to their home and rather, how do we do neighborhood retail that supports 90% of their needs and occasionally they have to get to the line to, you know, get to Hamilton or downtown or so forth. Yeah, um, well, trans is absolutely critical to make that happen. Um, and, you know, Safeway does provide you know, an affordable option for food and, you know, the, it's full service so you can get a broad range of things there that you may not be able to get at a smaller market, for instance, closer to home. But transit does connect all those opportunities along the corridor. So to your point of making it a five minute walk, um, you know, five minutes on the bus too is can cover quite a bit of area and connect you to a number of services, whether it's health related, whether it's food related, whether it's education along the corridor. So I, I don't know that it's necessarily an attribute that each station has to have all multiple qualities within that station, knowing that they're going to be dispersed um, along the corridor. But I think where opportunities for redevelopment occur, we, we want to look for if it's a commercial, for instance, opportunity, can we bring smaller businesses, convenient type uses that people use on a daily basis at that station. And it really depends on the physical environment and what's really available at those stations, which is why we do this initial exercise to understand where the opportunities are. And then, you know, what, what might rise up out of those vacant underutilized parcels along along the way, so. But maybe if I asked it differently, because if, if we move away from the Safeways and the targets, right, the suburban models mm -hmm. and say, mm -hmm. how can we take the study area and populate it with lots of neighborhood retail, if that was one of our land use strategies, right? Because, and then say, how can we support that? Not necessarily try on mission, trying to develop up mixed use, right? That might be, you know, part of it is and, but, that's that's more of the challenge I see. Sure, and, and it may be against not. Um, I mean, along this corridor, I think we're less worried about what the impact of big box development would be because it's probably not likely to locate on this corridor. Um, and you know, if it were, certainly we can. There's a regulatory approach that you can develop to to keep certain size of commercial development down to a smaller level. So that's one way to address um, kind of that competition that big box might, might impair um, smaller development, commercial services and goods around the corridor. There's really a model that the streetcar era of development created. You know, Portland's an excellent model. Pittsburgh's another one. I think Minneapolis, St. Paul has this characteristic too that about every half mile, there were these sort of major streetcar lines. Um, and within that, within those half mile designations along the corridor itself, about a quarter to a half mile, you had these commercial nodes. You'd have an apartment complex with, you know, a block and a half of storefront commercial development, maybe a small movie theater. I mean, we have this in spades across Portland. And so what you find is you, We've created a market of 
New Seasons, which is not a Safeway or a big box. It's a smaller neighborhood model. Um, it works in a 20,000 or less footprint. Um, and literally every thriving neighborhood in Portland has a New Seasons, has the ice cream shop, you know, has the brew pub, has the dry cleaners right on kind of the traditional main street. And with this process, we can we can allow those models to develop. I mean, the re regulations can be a tool to to help set that up. And there is a, you know, a physical spacing that has evolved over time and what markets can absorb. And we can use those, I think, to help to help guide us. Thank you. Anyone else? Sure. Um, perhaps this is a question for did oh, he left? I think <laughs> um, the design, the current design of the city line stops. Do they incorporate bicycle facilities in every one of the stops, or just limited stops? Um, they have a different range of what I've seen, um, and I've looked at a number of the different types, and certainly they allow bike lanes, for instance, to continue through where stations are. So they've pulled the station, for instance, away from the curb and allow the bike to go behind and around the bus so you don't mess with bus operations, which is important for them to hit their, you know, seven and a half minute timed marks. Um, so, yeah, I think that that your agency has done a pretty good job of preserving you know, all those bike facilities where they currently exist, um, they're, they're working in tandem, tandem with that. So, um, as well as adding, you know, bike parking, um, at some of the stations too. So. I think if, Thanks. if, if you all are, I mean, if you really want to address bike ridership, and I haven't seen um, the Boone Avenue protected bikeway, but that is really the system that changes the ridership numbers. Portland, we made a decision six years ago to invest in greenways versus investing in, you know, continuous mile long protected bikeway corridors. And so our ridership, it, it hits a ceiling and it's really not able to break through. And as important as the greenway routes are, because they're safe and they're close to families, they don't always connect to destinations. And I think the lesson from Lincoln is when you build that mile long continuous infrastructure, people use that facility because it's safe. It's protected from auto traffic. If you have bike signals at the intersections and that's where ridership levels can exceed expectations. Um, but, you know, that's, it, it's tough to get there. It's a little more expensive, but I think in, in Portland's terms where we're robust, robust biking community, it's time for us now to start investing in those more kind of major protected bike facilities to, to up, up the numbers and, and really create key routes. And I think we're getting closer to that. We're, we're kind of shifting policy and now saying, yeah, let's, let's do some of those bigger investments. I mean, what you all have done around around the Spokane River is just amazing. Your trail network is is phenomenal. Um, and those need to extend then into the neighborhoods and connect to transit. And um, but you're you know you're well into having those systems already. So I think if we find a couple of corridors that we can improve and maybe Children of the Sun is a really good route for us to focus on. How do we make that work really well for the city line? I think is a, a real opportunity for us. I think we should push, we should push hard on that um, if there's an opportunity to do that. If there aren't more questions at this point, I, I should have introduced Jason at the beginning, but uh, <laughs> just wanted to Thank Jason for for being our project manager for this study. Um, we're, ex we're excited to have him on board. Well, I'll just say I, I appreciate it. it. It 
what I've seen so far looks great. I mean, there's so much opportunity there that that we can take advantage of. So great. We just need to think ahead. You're doing that. I mean, it, it was great to see the housing action plan. Um, I think we're, we're going to dial into that um, pretty intently. So another side element of this is we're still looking at uh, better virtual uh, public participation avenues and I, I'm hoping that the housing action plan and this planning effort, we're going to test drive out some different online forums for that. Um, and we'll see. Other communities are starting to have better kind of virtual participation, even offline, not in a meeting format, but you can comment and deep dive in. Uh, we've used, uh, you know, our story maps before and got feedback in that fashion, but we are, we continue to. I think we're going to be in this situation of limited face to face, you know, sitting around a table with crayons and drawing Lewis with crayons anyway for a <laughs> while. So we need to uh, continue to keep that virtual engagement opportunity very strong through this year. Lewis and um, Jason, this is Lori. Hi. I would urge you to reach out to the business community, uh, both along East Sprague and downtown. There is some resistance to both bus and bike um, infrastructure, and I think some education would go a long way to showing those individuals what the benefits are to our community and to them personally. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I've gone round and round with some of them, but I don't have <laughs> the expertise, Jason, that you do, or you do, Lewis. So, um, I'm just that political person flapping her lips. So I think it would be worth your while to reach out to those groups. There's been some discussion about bringing somebody in um, just kind of for an educational forum and have that be recorded that we can continue to share over the next couple of years as we go out. Um, just focused on that higher level of bike infrastructure uh, that we know moves the needle better than even the greenways. So. Yeah, and, and maybe even connecting you all to folks in Lincoln, it's sometimes it's helpful to hear from, you know, the downtown Lincoln association, which is their business association was really championed the end street protected bikeway um, along with the economic development department. And it was a, one of the key city councilors who's who really brought it in front of everyone and said, Hey, we, we need to look at this. Um, it was in the plan from 2005 and I think it's a priority and. And like you said, Lori, it it was a bit of a heavy lift to get all the businesses comfortable with the changes that were going to happen on that street um, to get the bike facility in there. So, um, but it has been a catalyst for redevelopment. And I don't know how many you know nicknames of new housing developments, some of which have no parking associated with them. Um, their their really selling point is that they're on the end street protected bikeway. So, it it has become an amenity. Lori, I believe we're uh, Jason's in front of council at a study session. Is that next week? That's so I'd, next like, week. I'd, I'd like Colin to be able to reach out to you to see if there's any suggestions from you on if we need to tweak any of this um, yeah. for that study session. Yeah, and uh, that'd be great. I'm just looking at it. And it, it, it is so good. What it, what we might want to do is, is include some of the challenges that we face because I'm on the STA board and part of the central, the city line steering committee, some of the challenges that we faced over the last few years in just getting people on board and talking about the benefits. Um, so, and I'd be glad to, I'd be glad to do whatever I can. So yes, loop me in. Thank you. Yeah, we'll schedule a time. The that attention. Benefit? We've been recording this presentation and it's going to go up on the project website, either this one, or if the council session is even better, we'll, we'll take that one. So this is kind of a, a shareable item and we're building a project web page for this information along with other background information. So that's coming. Okay. Well, anyone else? Uh, Todd, I've got a question for Lewis. Please. Um, could 
I know some earlier work was done on the city line talking uh, to neighborhoods that were bordering or it went through or whatever connected to the city line. But um, as this um, grows and there's the uh, studies continue, is there a way to loop the neighborhoods back in on a continuous basis? Because it makes a, it's going to make a big change for those neighborhoods and it, it could be positive, but I think you need to bring the neighborhoods along. Definitely the, the neighborhoods that this project is in will be inv heavily involved in this and then we'll be continuing to share that out for all the other routes that we're going to be working on in the next couple of years. Jason has a great big D10 dozer and he's going to start running that up and down the streets and yes. that should get the neighborhood's attention also. So. <laughs> well, Lewis, can you loop me into that as the liaison for the CA so I know what's going on there? Definitely will. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Well, if we're winding down, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, we look forward to the next steps. Tom, okay, when did you move from when did you move from the St. Paul region to Spokane? Oh, 20 years ago. Okay. It's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. <laughs> you know, they're still talking about Rondo. That's a big that's a big hot yeah. button item in, in the reparations around that. So I'm kind of glad I'm glad you brought that up today. Yeah, and you know, everything, even even the the bike pass in Minneapolis are, are great, you know, examples. Yeah, you know, connecting the river that reminds me a lot of this area, you know, Mississippi pathways, and then how they connected that into the neighborhood. So yeah, that's yeah. pretty amazing. Great. Well, thank you. Okay, thank you. We're adjourned. Thanks. Have a good evening. Thank you all. I'm waving. Good night.